hear me? I'm sorry. I'm really sorry for this. So uh, now nutrition, you know, nutrition is the key to optimal performance in any field. If you want to perform and maximize uh, the hard work that you're doing, you need to be able to uh, perform. Uh, you have to fuel your uh, workouts and your uh, physical activity. So if you are able to understand the role of various uh, macronutrients and micronutrients, you will be able to design and plan your diet according to yourself and your, your own uh, requirements and keep in, so that you are strong and energetic throughout your uh, day and life. Uh, before I begin to talk about the various nutrients, uh, you know, so you, it is a good idea to understand the various energy systems so that uh, everything can be put to perspective. Um, now, uh, imagine before that there's an analogy to a wallet. Uh, suppose you have a wallet with you, which has certain uh, number of coins. Uh, the, you will obviously use the coin first and then the smaller notes and then the bigger notes and then you'll change the larger notes and then move on to your saving banks accounts. Uh, for uh, other further reserves. Uh, but the unit that is used is always the coins. And so here, the, in the, uh, whenever you, you need energy, it is the ATP in the body that is used as energy. So even if some other uh, substrate is being used or a macronutrients is being used, it is at the end the adenosine triphosphate that you would be using for your energy uh, requirements. And um, adenosine triphosphate has adenosine um, uh, and three phosphate radicals. The first bond uh, where the phosphate radical is, um, is a very weak bond. And so when that breaks, uh, whenever you have an energy requirement that, that bond breaks and energy is released, and then you have uh, ADP and a phosphate radical free, and then energy is released. And that is the energy that you, you utilize eventually, no matter what substrate that you are using. Then once the ATP, it lasts for a very, very uh, short time, it may be for a few seconds, and then you move on to the ATP CP phase. Uh, CP is the creatine phosphate, which is present in the cell, and the creatine phosphate provides uh, one phosphate radical to the adenosine diphosphate, which we had got from the previous energy system. And again, uh, adenosine triphosphate is formed which is again further used for energy. So again, this lasts for a shorter period and then eventually you move on to the aerobic system. Carbohydrates are the preferred source of energy, as you all know. And when there is enough oxygen, you will be working in the aerobic phase. So in the aerobic phase, uh, carbohydrates are used. Uh, first, they are converted into pyruvic acid and then into oxaloacetate which undergoes the entire Krebs cycle and then again comes back to formation of oxaloacetate. Oxaloacetate is carbohydrate in nature. So I will come to this later when I talk about the usage of uh, substrates in your uh, workouts, whether it's weight training or cardio, but you must remember that you need some amount of carbohydrate if you want fat burning to take place. Otherwise, no fat burning will take place because the, that is needed for the reactions. So aerobic phase occurs when uh, in presence of oxygen and uh, one molecule of carbohydrate will give you 36 molecules of ATP in one Krebs cycle uh, reactions. Then where if, the, if your exercise is very intense and if there will be lack of oxygen and so uh, you know it's not absence of oxygen. Uh, remember that is lack of oxygen because your exercise is so intense that uh, the hemoglobin is, uh, and the blood flow may not be enough to provide as much oxygen and nutrients as is needed at that point of time. And so uh, it is not as efficient as the aerobic system. And uh, one molecule of carbohydrate may just give you two to three molecules of ATP. So when this uh, glycogen uh, is used more, you, you will see that if you're doing HIIT or very intense training, especially weight training, where there is microtrauma, you are using, you are in the anaerobic phase rather than the aerobic phase. And if you're walking slow, then it's obviously the aerobic phase. So uh, the first substrate we would like to talk about is carbohydrate. One molecule of carbohydrate will give you four calories of energy. 
carbohydrates, uh, when you ingest them, uh, their digestion partly occurs in the mouth. And so, uh, you know, there's there are enzymes in the saliva which act on the carbohydrate. And when you swallow them, eventually the digestion is completed in the stomach and they are assimilated in the intestines. Uh, carbohydrates are of four kinds, uh, monosaccharides, which have one unit of sugar, uh, for example, glucose and fructose. Fructose is a fruit sugar and galactose is a combination of uh, glucose and milk sugar, that is lactose. Disaccharides have two units of sugar. Uh, they are also comparatively simpler carbohydrates. Uh, sugars are, uh, and especially the beverages like you have at home, Complan, Bon Vita and such, uh, beverages which have disaccharides. Uh, oligosaccharides have three to nine molecules of carbohydrate and they are present. They are carbohydrates in the vegetables and uh, pulses, legumes and so on. And then the polysaccharides which is the starch, uh, especially in the potatoes, sweet potatoes, yams and the cereals. Now, uh, if you talk about uh, getting carbohydrate from animal sources, then I would like to tell you that carbohydrate in animal is stored in the form of glycogen. And whenever you uh, cut, when the animal is butchered, immediately the glycogen gets oxidized. And so you will never get carbohydrate from an animal uh, non-vegetarian food. Uh, the uh, sources of carbohydrates are primarily from plant uh, sources. The functions of carbohydrates are that they are the primary source of energy. They are the preferred fuel used by the body. The brain can only use carbohydrate and not fat for energy, for its functioning. You know, brain is made up of fats and cholesterol, and it cannot be self-destructive by having using fats as a fuel, unless and until there is a serious uh, autoimmune disorder. Uh, it is stored in the form of energy in us, uh, in uh, liver and muscle as glycogen, and it has a protein sparing action. So if you are having uh, enough carbohydrate in your body, the muscle, the protein will be allowed to repair the organs, tissues, and uh, be involved in muscle building rather than, um, you know, for as an energy resource. So it's, it ha carbohydrates have a protein sparing action. And uh, so since we have spoken about glycogen, I would like to uh, tell you, especially trainers who are there, that you must uh, always tell your clients, uh, even if you're doing your, ex your own exercise yourself, of course, that you should do your weight training sessions first and then your cardio sessions after that if you have to do them together. Uh, so there are different schedules when we like to do cardio early morning on an empty stomach to initiate fat oxidation. But if you have a limited period of time, then it is good to do your weight training first and the cardiovascular exercises later. The reason for that, that every person who is entering the gym should target uh, muscle gain and fat loss. Now, when you start doing your cardiovascular exercises, you are first, uh, the blood glucose will be used first and after that, it will, it will be the liver glycogen and then uh, eventually your glycogen resources will deplete and by the time a substantial time is over and once that happens you will move on to do your weight training and you need your glycogen for that whereas your glycogen reserves have completely depleted fat burning will not take place because some amount of carbohydrate is needed uh, in the Krebs cycle for fat uh, oxidation as I told you earlier so your weight training performance will also not be optimal causing the required micro trauma for muscle building later on so the purpose is entirely not solved at all so if you do the opposite, if you do your weight training first, then the muscle glycogen will be used first. And your, once your glycogen resources are depleted, it will be time for fat burning. And that will be the right time to move on to your cardiovascular exercise when immediately the stored fats will start getting utilized. So if you understand that, uh, you know, it will be very simple for you to design your uh, workouts. Uh, now we come to fiber. Fiber is also a kind of uh, polysaccharide. It comes in the carbohydrate category, but it has you know, more than 10,000 units of sugar. So the body does not have enough enzymes to digest uh, the fiber. And that helps in a certain sense that it keeps, it gives you a very good satiety index because the body is still attempting to 
digest the fiber, whereas it cannot, and so its movement in the gut is very slow. So it keeps you full for a long time and prevents hunger pangs so that you know, it has a very good satiety index and will not cause you to binge. Then it also absorbs the bad fats and uh, you know, it, it controls the cholesterol or uh, you know, dietary bad fats to get into your body. And uh, the one very good thing that it does is it lowers the glycemic index. That's a very important function for, of uh, fiber. Uh, once it, um, you know, it is, uh, if, what is glycemic index? First, you need to know that it is the rate at which your blood sugar rises once uh, your carbohydrate is digested and goes into the blood. So if you have a carbohydrate, which is a simple sugar, there will be a spike in the blood sugar and the brain will uh, give a signal to the pancreas to increase, to produce insulin. The insulin will take the carbohydrate to the liver or to the muscle uh, to, uh, to be stored as glycogen. But if uh, the reserves are full and if you're not doing any physical activity at that time for the carbohydrate to be utilized, that will be converted into fat and stored. And that is something which we do not want. So we prefer to have a food with a low glycemic index. And you know, in that case, the carbohydrate will be released very slowly into the blood and it will not either spike your uh, blood sugar and you will never be low sugar, uh, you know, hypoglycemic also. And so the um, only as much sugar as is needed for you to carry out your physical activities at that point of time, uh, they will be, uh, you know, that much will be used. So we like to have a carbohydrate of low glycemic index. And so fiber does a very good function, uh, you know, um, it, uh, by reducing the glycemic index, it also provides a bulk to the stools. And so it is good for the gut. Now, the sources of carbohydrate are uh, cereals. Uh, cereals include uh, jawar, uh, bajra, ragi, wheat, rice, maize. Uh, from pulses, it is in, you know, legumes and dals like rajma and all that, and fruit, uh, fruit is a source of carbohydrate. Uh, the carbohydrate in the fruit is fructose. It is also called nature's candy. It's simple sugar. So unless and until the fruit is very fibrous, you can remember that it might have a high glycemic index. And so your choice of fruit and also the portion in fruit and the timing uh, should be very wisely and judiciously made. The carbohydrate in the milk is lactose and uh, another source of carbohydrate is the vegetables. Uh, as I told you earlier, non-vegetarian foods have no carbohydrates and oils have no carbohydrates. I would like to talk about the structure of wheat here because these days we see a lot that wheat has, uh, you know, a lot of people have glu uh, this uh, gluten intolerance. So uh, the wheat has an outer structure which, has, which is made of husk and inside that is the bran and inside, further inside that is the endosperm and the wheat germ. Once the husk is removed, you have the whole wheat with the bran uh, that is fiber and that is excellent. But if you remove that also, then only the inner part remains, the endosperm and the wheat germ. And when you grind that, you have white flour that is maida and that has very high glycemic index. We do not like to use uh, high glycemic index. Uh, the uh, high glycemic index carbo carbohydrates must only be used either if you actually have a condition of hypoglycemia or low blood sugar or immediately after your workout. Uh, just after your workout, your blood, your glycogen reserves have depleted substantially uh, and you need an insulin spike because at that time, if you take your protein, that protein will reach the um, muscles very quickly and insulin helps to get the nutrients inside the cell. So if you take your protein and your uh, you know, glutamine or whatever nutrients you want to take immediately after workout, uh, they, they, you know, there is a window period of 20 minutes where the IGF-1 and natural hormones are high and your body needs it all very desperately, but it even needs an insulin spike. So if you take it at that time, the recovery will be maximal. And if you prolong that period and you take your nutrients after, uh, you know, say after one hour, you may have catabolism or fat loss, uh, fat loss to an extent you need. But 
uh, the you will not have the kind of hypertrophy that you are looking for and that's the same recovery might take place after 48 to 72 hours so if, if, as it is if you are going to you consume those calories it's a very good idea to time your nutrient and your uh, you know post workout shake immediately after your workout now we come to proteins. Proteins have uh, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and the very special nitrogen element in that, and that makes them special. Uh, there are essential and non-essential aminos which combine to form various proteins. Um, so uh, the essential ones are those that are required by the body. The body cannot m m produce them on its own, but non-essentials are, uh, they can be synthesized in the body if all the essential aminos are present. Uh, the essential aminos are uh, branch chain amino acids, which you all know are very popular, leucine, isoleucine, valine, and popular for the right reasons because they are very, very relevant. Uh, tryptophan, methionine, thionine, phenyl, alanine, and lysine. Now, uh, histidine of these is uh, very relevant in infancy, and later on, it, uh, it, it becomes irrelevant. In adults, it is not needed, but it is an essential amino acid. It's classified as such because it has to be provided and the body cannot synthesize it, and because infancy is such an important period. Then the conditionally essential aminos are uh, the arginine, cysteine, tyrosine, glutamine, and glycine. Now, uh, typically I would like to talk about arginine and glutamine because these are very, very popular. Now, uh, consider glutamine if, you, uh, if your workout has been extremely intense and heavy, then uh, you know, after your glycogen reserves have depleted, uh, the body sometimes start uh, oxidation of glutamine also. Glutamine is the most abundant amino present in your body, and it has a very important function, which is very rele relevant, particularly in these days, and that is immunity. Now, if you are, uh, if you're depleted of glutamine, uh, your recovery will be very prolonged. You may have a lot of soreness, and then you know your immunity is an all-time low. Uh, after that kind of microtrauma that has occurred in the gym, immediately after your workout, definitely you, know, you have to. Your resistance will be at its all-time low, and so it becomes conditionally essential to provide uh, glutamine uh, separately. So it is present in uh, non-vegetarian foods and in uh, whey proteins and also as a supplement. Arginine is very popular. It helps in muscle building, uh, especially because it breaks down into nitrogen oxide and it dilates the blood vessels. And so, uh, you know, the blood flow is enhanced and you get a better uh, pump. So since the nutrients are reaching and the oxygen is reaching the muscles, the recovery is much quicker. So uh, these become conditionally essential if you are doing that level of physically, physical activity. Otherwise, they are also synthesized in the body, but not to the extent that might be needed if you're doing a lot of work. Now, uh, the uh, essential uh, amino acids combine to form different uh, uh, protein chains. And the kind of aminos that will be formed is also determined by your own genetic disposition and the structure of the DNA, RNA that you have. Otherwise, proteins have a, the, you know, the primary function, of course, uh, it goes without saying that it has the function of bone building and muscle building and making hormones. Um, then the exoskeleton, the hair, skin, and nails are uh, made of proteins and also the repair of tendons, ligaments, organs, glands, they all need protein. Now, uh, the neurotransmitters, you know, that is something uh, which I'd like to tell you that the nerve cells have a main cell body. The whole cell is known as a neuron. The whole, the, uh, after the cell body is the axon, which is covered with the migraine shed. And then at the end, there is the dendron. So between two neurons, uh, there are neutro neurotransmitters which take electrical impulses, convert them into chemical energy, and then reconvert them into electrical impulses and pass them on to the next neuron. That is how the transmission of impulses and messages takes place in the body. And these neurotransmitters are proteinaceous in nature. So that's how, that is also how you need protein. So you can understand that 
uh, even if you're not doing anything, you're just lying on the bed, if there is a patient who is sick and even not raising a finger or not even sitting down, you still need some amount of protein to maintain the organs, your body, your muscle tone and the repair of ear and tear and body functions. Uh, the quality of protein is determined by the amount of nitrogen, uh, you know, retention and the nitrogen absorbed, utilized and retained by the body. So the more nitrogen is utilized, the better is the quality of protein. Uh, so in, in whole foods, if you consider whole foods, the best protein uh, is of course mother's milk, but that becomes irrelevant very quickly. And so then after that we have egg, uh, fish, chicken, and as the hierarchy of animals goes up, the quality of protein uh, decreases. So when you come to red meats, uh, you know, the mutton, beef, and so on, the quality of protein goes down. And it is only after that, that uh, after all, all the non-vegetarian foods that the nitrogen retention uh, quality of, uh, you know, the chance of milk comes in. Uh, whey protein is a very superior protein, but when you consider whole milk, it also has lactose and saturated fatty acid, fat, fat globules, and so on. So uh, milk, uh, you know, comes uh, lower in the hierarchy of good proteins when it is whole milk. Then we have soya beans and nuts, uh, oil seeds, pulses, and then in the end, cereals. Cereals are poor proteins. Cereals are essentially for carbohydrate purposes. And uh, then you have, I want to talk about soya milk. You know, soya milk has been uh, uh, projected to be a great superfood, uh, especially the vegetarians like to take uh, soya beans. But in large quantities, it is not good, good enough. As it is, I so told you earlier that if you have incomplete proteins, then when you combine two incomplete proteins, they form beautiful chains of complete proteins. So that's another uh, trick for the vegetarians. Uh, you know, if you are a vegetarian or your client is a vegetarian and you are not able to give that kind of protein needed for, uh, you know, specific goals, then you combine proteins and it works very, very well. Uh, so, but soya bean should be definitely taken in lower portions because it has uh, toxins which are called goitrogens that can cause uh, goiter. Uh, it has carcinogens and you know what carcinogenic, uh, carcinogenic uh, substances are. They can potentially cause cancer, especially in people who are susceptible. And it has uh, phytoestrogen. You know, it has a large amount of it and uh, that is a precursor to estrogen. So especially in men, in large quantities, soya bean is not good. However, uh, some amount of estrogen is present in men and some amount of testosterone is present in women, uh, which has uh, have very significant role and are very relevant. Uh, so when it comes to protein, we all talk about whey protein and non-vegetarian protein, but there is one protein which is uh, very important and that is casein. <coughs> So when the milk curdles, you have, you know, the watery part and the solid part. The solid part is basically paneer, which you call, and that is actually casein. When you, come, you consider a supplement, the fats and the lactose have been removed from it, and it actually makes an excellent protein, except that post-workout, it may not be a very good idea to take casein, because uh, casein, when it goes into the stomach, uh, it is a slow-release protein. It is not immediately available to the body. It, when it goes into the stomach, the stomach has hydrochloric acid. It forms lumps with that and very, very slowly protein is released into the body. Um, now, in my practical experience, I have uh, tried this a lot and it has worked very well. Uh, these days, people who are fitness conscious, they have an early dinner and say salad and soup and that to a light one, say around 6 p.m. or 7 p.m. at the most. What happens is that by the time you know they are ready to sleep and they're finished off their work and you know their evening workouts and so on, they may feel hungry or may get into a catabolic state. And even if they are not and they just sleep off, their nitrogen balance may not remain positive, uh, which may again uh, cause catabolism in the body and break down muscle. We do not want that and casein does uh, it has a very good role here that before, uh, you know, a, a while before sleeping, if you take casein, first of all, it has a very good satiety index. It will keep you full because the lumps in the protein, in the stomach that have been formed with hydrochloric acid will not go, uh, you know, just uh, get absorbed very easily. And throughout the night, uh, you will remain in positive balance. 
and so it has a very good way it's a very good way to control the number of uh, calories that you're consuming uh, without being hungry it keeps you full it keeps a positive nitrogen balance there is your body is getting protein but you are not consuming too many calories so it's a very good idea to take a casein shake some people like to take it with the peanut butter to further uh, you know slow down the absorption and decrease the glycemic index and some people like to take it with chia seeds which are uh, very good uh, otherwise you know for general health and antioxidants the whey part which is the watery part uh, is you know again when the milk curdles the watery part is the whey and uh, technologically the it has been dried and when it has been isolated uh, then it it, for, it forms the one of the best uh, quality proteins whey protein is known as the rolls royce of protein it has very high an amount of BCAA, branch chain amino acid, and particularly leucine. Now, leucine is like a key to formation of uh, muscle, you know, the conversion of protein into actual muscle synthesis. Leucine has a very important role, and sometimes people take leucine supplements uh, separately uh, along with things like arginine because whatever function it is taken for is maximized because it helps in its synthesis. Um, now, the amino acid uh, chains that are present in the way, it has all the essential uh, amino acids. And uh, you, so, you know, it is a complete protein itself, very good for uh, vegetarians, particularly if you are not looking just for very purely vegan sources. Uh, it has very high nitrogen retention. And for diabetic patients, especially if it's a lactose-free whey protein, uh, it is something very, very essential. It's a must have because diabetic patients lose a lot of muscle mass because there is no insulin to get the nutrients into their body. They lose a lot of weight and they can have the fatty liver syndrome also. So to improve the muscle, uh, muscle mass, uh, lactose-free uh, whey protein is a very, very good choice. Now, as I said earlier, that even if you're not doing any activity, you need some amount of protein. Uh, so the minimum amount that you need is 0.8 to 1 gram of protein per kilogram of your body weight. That is if you are doing nothing. And then as your activity level goes up, uh, gradually, if you're doing cardio and a little bit of moderate amount of activity, it is 1.4 to 1.6 gram uh, per kg of your body weight, and it goes up to 2 to even 2.5 uh, grams uh, per kg of your body weight. Uh, I would like some, I, I was asked yesterday that, uh, you know, a high protein diet can adversely affect you. Um, you know, it may not do significant damage. I would like to add here, uh, that's my opinion, that uh, it's not my opinion, it is a fact actually that, you know, if you're making somebody work, you know, the body, human body is such that the body will adapt very quickly to work. But when, it, when you put somebody under stress, it is then that you get, it becomes counterproductive. So if you give protein, it's, your body is put to work. That's fine as far as you're utilizing it and you need it uh, for your specific target and goals. But if you are, uh, if you say you have alcohol, then even if you have less of it, the purpose of alcohol is to produce toxicity and uh, it can really give you stress. So that's the difference between work and stress. So uh, high protein means uh, uh, the, the damage comes in if you're, if you're, if you're, you already know your total calorie intake. So if you're uh, going to take protein and compromise a lot on carbohydrate and fat, you need to know why you're doing it. Are you doing it for a specific uh, competition for a limited period of time? or you are going to do it forever, that you need to analyze for yourself. Uh, but unless and until uh, you are having uh, a pre-existing condition, say you are having a problem with your liver or you have something in the uh, you know, renal function, unless until you have a pre-existing condition, it, is, it does not cause damage as such. Uh, but the conversion of uh, excess protein, so if you are taking protein more than can be converted into muscle, if you're not creating that demand, if you're not giving the micro trauma by weight bearing exercises, then the protein has nowhere to go. So it will be converted either to fat or it will be convert, used by, you know, in gluconeogenesis, it will, it will be converted into glucose. That may have byproducts and that kind of overloads the system. But if you're utilizing it, so you say if you're a bodybuilder, 
So I know I'm, I'm uh, being from a bodybuilding background. There are times when you need to uh, increase your protein intake and go down on carbohydrates or fats, depending on you know your water cycle or uh, whatever you're planning to do. So that does not stress your system at all. It, it is needed at that point of time because you're doing that kind of weight training. You might get into catabolism. So it really depends on your targets and what activity you are doing. So if you already have a fatty acid liver, what happens is the liver, liver plays a very important role in detoxifying. That's the main role of uh, liver. That's why even alcohol comes to liver because it needs to be broken down. Toxins are directly associated with liver. So if you are having a fatty acid condition already, the fat will not, you know, if you, you imagine a fat person is full of fat, that, that, that organ will not work well. So if you have a fatty acid, uh, fatty liver condition, it may affect the metabolism of glucose and also your acid balance. So when it comes to protein, then liver, uh, you know, it, uh, it helps to detoxify ammonia and ammonia is a byproduct of protein metabolism. So that is where you need to think about the uh, excess overload, uh, you know, of protein. Uh, so now um, the other side effects of excess protein, you know, it cannot, protein has no side effect. It is needed by a body. It is uh, actually nectar and amrit for your body that you should have very clear in your mind. In fact, Indian diets are never, uh, you know, enough. Uh, they, they never have enough protein. We need to make a conscious endeavor uh, to get that protein uh, into us. But uh, you know, if you are even considering that, then uh, let me tell you about two, three ambiguities and doubts and concerns. Uh, one of them is the acid load. So uh, if you, if people say that excess protein will decrease the pH of in the blood and uh, the acid load may go up. Uh, so what happens as a result of that is that to make it alkaline again, uh, the, uh, there are, uh, you know, bone, uh, the cells which break down bone tissue, they are called osteoclast and the bone formation cells are called osteoblast. So the osteoclast will become more active. They will leach out the, um, you know, calcium from the bone to make the blood alkaline. So that may cause osteoporosis and uh, affect your bone density. But using calcium isotopes to quantify uh, calcium kinetics, it has been found that in fact, there is no such negative effect because these were the concerns that have been raised and uh, a lot of studies and research has been done on this topic and it is not so, and there is evidence of that. Of course, that is in placebo conditions, but uh, you, know, you, you need to keep it in mind. So you know where to draw the balance even if you're going on a high protein diet. Um, then also there is no evidence for uh, the adverse effect on the renal health when it comes to increased glomerular pressure and hyperfiltration. Uh, these uh, conditions occur only if you already have an issue or a dead genetic uh, disposition you know, with your kidneys. Kidneys can get harmed if you're not drinking enough water, simple as that. Just have enough water in your, uh, in your, in your routine. You need to, uh, water in fact, we are 75%, we are made up of water and it is actually the most important nutrient. And I will talk about water also in great detail. So uh, when uh, the protein has been increased in, uh, you know, placebo groups, uh, it has, you know, enhanced weight loss, there is reduction in truncal adipose tissue, improved uh, lipid profile and maintenance of blood glucose. Uh, also proteins, natural proteins I'm talking about, they have high satiety index. And if you are including, uh, you know, the, the foods uh, with all due respect to vegetarians, but if you have a portion of veget non-vegetarian food in your diet, uh, I know by experience, it keeps you very strong. It will prevent a lot of binge eating also. Uh, protein supplementation, uh, continuously for a six month period, along with strength training. If you're uh, doing the weight bearing exercises, it improves, it increases the insulin growth factor one, the IGF one, uh, you know, the natural and serum bone alkaline phosphate. Uh, so we were talking about osteoporosis due to excess uh, protein, but that doesn't happen. In fact, it has seen, it has been seen to increase uh, bone formation. So this is about protein and uh, I hope that answers that question. And uh, now we come to fat. Fat is present in our body in the form of uh, triglyceride, phospholipids and cholesterol. 
triglyceride is present throughout the body. One uh, triglyceride has one glycerol and three free fatty acids, FFAs. And uh, the very common ones are stearic acid, oleic acid, and palmitic acid, which are the most common. Uh, I would like to talk to you about the structure of uh, fatty acid. Uh, you know, I will try to keep it as simple, but just pay a little attention. Uh, so if you have, I hope that you understand what uh, carbon and hydrogen atom are. It's a very, very basic chemistry. Uh, the, the number of carbon atoms uh, in a fat, uh, fatty acid molecules are always even. Okay, so that's the first thing you should understand. Uh, a carbon atom has a valency of four. Valency is the number of electron. Uh, there is a, when you do an electronic configuration, the outermost shell has to have a certain number of uh, electrons to keep it neutral. So uh, carbon, ne carbon needs eight electrons in its outermost shell, and, uh, but it has four. So th this, you know, it has a valency of four. So uh, if, if there are enough hydrogen atoms, they will attach you know, on all the sides and so you form a saturated fatty acid. Now suppose there is a, a carbon atom and it, will, it always has to have, as I said, even number of carbons. So carbon will attach to another carbon on one. There are three sides left. So you have three hydrogen atoms attaching to this first carbon atom and that CH3 forms an omega site. Now uh, the next, next carbon atom uh, you know, it has C and, and again, it will be, uh, you know, uh, bonding to the next carbon atom. So it has, it will uh, attach to two hydrogen atoms. So you have CH3, CH2, and that's how the chain continues. If the hydrogen atoms are not enough, then two subsequent carbon atoms form a double bond. Now this double bond is very weak. So that, you know, that is called an unsaturated fatty acid. So in a single molecule, if there is only one double bond, it is called a monounsaturated fatty acid. And if there are several bonds, then it is called a polyunsaturated fatty acid, several double bonds. Now from the omega side, the CH3 side, as I explained to you, if the double bond is on the third carbon atom, then it is known as uh, the omega-3. And if, it is, if the double bond is on the sixth atom, then it is called omega-6. Omega-9 also exists, but it has no uh, significance you know, dietary, in the dietary, uh, no, no dietary significance. So fats, therefore, are present in our body as saturated fats, unsaturated fats, and cholesterol. Saturated fats, of course, it's hydrogen all over. So, you know, it's a very self-explanatory formula if you've understood that. If there is any doubt, you can always write to me. I have received several questions on my email. I've answered most of them. I think there's just one question pending from my last workshop. You all can write to me at ritasing76 at hotmail.com. I will be more than happy to explain. And really, I want to just mention it here. I'd love to do that. So don't hesitate. And... Uh, uh, the unsaturated fatty acids are uh, PUFA and MUFA, the polyunsaturated fatty acids, and the monounsaturated fatty acids. The polyunsaturated fatty acids are omega-3 and omega-6. <clears throat> omega-3 will increase the HDL and decrease LDL. So HDL is the high-density lipoprotein. It is a good cholesterol. It is much needed. It dissolves bad fats with its cells and eliminates them. LDL is the bad one. We do not want that. It is a low density lipoprotein. It sticks to the arteries and can cause, cause arthrosclerosis. Now, HDL is more present in women because of estrogen. And as I mentioned it earlier, that estrogen is a protective hormone and it keeps, it protects the heart and it also prevents osteoporosis. So women don't have these concerns, uh, especially before menopause. Uh, so the high density lipo lipoprotein can be increased by having omega-3 in your diet and weight bearing exercise in particular. That is why women must do, that is, one of the several reasons why one uh, women must do weight training. And uh, the omega-6 has no effect on either HDL or LDL, but uh, it, you know, nevertheless, it is a very, you know, it is, since it is not increasing the LDL and uh, some foods, some diets need 
you know, uh, oils with high smoking point for the kind of cooking and there omega-6 uh, works very well like olive oil. And uh, then you have the monounsaturated fatty acids which uh, decrease LDL but they have no effect on uh, the HDL. So uh, omega-6, uh, you know, it is present in peanut oil, sunflower oil, safflower oil, canola oil, corn oil, and sesame oil, and uh, MUFA, the monounsaturated fatty acids are present in olive oil, peanut oil, mustard oil, almond oil, and omega-3 are, are the, you know, essential fatty acids. Again, EFA are those that have to be provided from outside. Uh, they are present in fish oil, walnut, flaxseed, uh, almond in rajma, green leafy vegetable, rice bran oil. Uh, I'd like to, uh, you, I'd like you to focus on the vegetarian ones because uh, it is very difficult. I know it's very challenging for trainers and dietitians to uh, devise a diet for vegetarians where you want them to do very, very well, but you don't know how to manage. I mean, even I, uh, you know, look upon uh, vegetarian athletes and I always ask them, how do you manage? How is the result? And, you know, that kind of talking to people, even if you know everything, uh, talking to people and getting their feedback will help you, uh, you know, to get more and more experience. Uh, then uh, amongst the fat is one very, very special one, and that is the MCT, that is medium uh, chain triglyceride. One of the best sources is coconut oil. It is very, very good for bodybuilders because it reduces waist circum uh, circumference. It has 10% uh, less calories than the long chain uh, triglyceride, like the olive oil, nuts, avocados. They have, it has, uh, the MCT has lesser calories. It has leptin and peptide bye bye, which keeps you full. Leptin is the hormone. It, it helps to build that hormone. And leptin, that is a hormone which gives you the signal that your uh, stomach is full. So you will not have hunger pants and it controls the calories and the diet that you are eating. It improves the gut environment by optimizing the growth of good bacteria. Then again, for bodybuilders, this is very relevant that MCT reduces lactate building and increases fat burning and reduces the need for carbs. So if you are presently you know, near the competition, you don't want to consume too many carbohydrates, you want fat burning and to, because the exercise at that time will cause the lactic acid accumulation, MCT is the thing for you. Nevertheless, it is still a fat, so the portion control must be there. Uh, it is, you know, you can have it even in between meal, meals or in some of your protein shakes and it's one spoon a day, not more than that, five grams. Uh, one very good oil is macadamia oil. It is very close to the structure of the uh, oil in the skin. It is very, very good, but uh, unfortunately in India, you do not get it. Uh, when I was working with Species Nutrition, they have it and until now I have searched a lot for it in the Indian supermarkets. So if any of you comes across that, uh, from India, let me also know. I don't know from where you get it, but I just want to mention it that macadamia oil is an excellent thing. And I, for myself, make sure that I have macadamia whole nuts, um, you know, just two a day, but I make sure that I have it. It's a very good fat to have. Uh, then MCT, uh, coming back to MCT, it also improves brain function and it is very good for children with the uh, ADHD. Uh, the attention deficit hyperactive uh, disorder and for children with autism. It's very good for autistic, uh, uh, you know, children and for autistic adults also. It is very beneficial for children who have epilepsy or even a tendency for it. And it is very good for elderly people who may have a disposition to Alzheimer's disease. So even when you see uh, the beginning of dementia in old people, it is very good to take coconut oil. In South India, a lot of people take it and, you know, uh, it is very good for them. You, you see them, uh, you know, the South Indians, they eat so much of rice and then still they are, most of them are very, very lean. Uh, so the functions of fats, uh, it, the fats keep the body warm. They protect the internal organs. Uh, then they help, this is a very important function. They help in the dissolving and transportation of uh, fat soluble vitamins like A, D, E, K, and they are required for the brain structure and neurotransmitter and the myclin sheath. I mentioned the myclin sheath earlier, which is uh, covering the exon on the 
nerve cell and it that the pets are very much needed that they are important for the normal growth in children uh, they are important for the production of milk in lactating mothers and in stimulation and flow of bile now bile is you know it it uh, because of the breakdown of rbc that has to be removed if that is not removed then uh, you know the, the you may develop a gallbladder stone so for the stimulation and flow of bile fats are needed so you must include good fats in your diet you know you can see that it is very important for the structure of skin and the fats also reduce the glycemic index of food so if you are eating say rice it will you know uh, increase the blood sugar uh, you know because that's uh, that can uh, the glycemic index of rice is not that low so if you want to further reduce the glycemic index you can have a little bit of ghee that's what was done traditionally and uh, of course uh, you know the portion that's very little ghee not full of it not soaking in that uh, because of the calories and because it's a saturated fat but remember that saturated fat is also needed for the uh, sex hormones that is the testosterone and also the uh, you know it is very uh, important because of the for uh, the brain the structure of the brain so cholesterol is also part of your uh, body which is much needed so uh, uh, here comes the glycemic index of food which is reduced and the lubrication of joints especially the omega 3 now between two joints there is a uh, synovial fluid which is actually otherwise in the form of a gel and when you warm up it starts uh, liquidifying so when it liquidifies a bit then it acts as a cushion when you do high impact exercises so it cushions the joint so you must have uh, omega 3 so that the production of the synovial fluid happens and of course then uh, fats are important for the skin structure okay after fats we come to vitamins they are like vital amines uh, amines is like a group uh, you know and uh, vitamins have a carbon structure because they are organic biology produced biologically produced uh, uh, substances and uh, like you have the methyl group and the omega group am amine is a group of atoms uh, you know in certain configuration and vitamins act as catalyst for various reactions so a catalyst is something that um, you know does not participate in the um, it, it doesn't participate in the reaction but it facilitates and expedites a particular reaction so that is what a catalyst is and uh, so uh, vitamins are of two kinds one is a d e k and uh, they are fat soluble vitamins and the water soluble vitamins are b and c the fat soluble uh, you know vitamins they can be stored in the body along with the fat so if you don't have them every day in your diet it's fine or if you have an overall balance and but you know uh, the uh, the flip side of it is that if you take too much of it it can cause toxicity but the water soluble uh, vitamins will not cause you toxicity whatever excess you take uh, will be excreted sometimes uh, vitamin c may uh, react with the oxalates in spinach and form kidney stone but that is only if you have a genetic disposition for that if you have that you know even people who have got their kidney stones removed they again get it because they they have a, a disposition to that so if you have something like that or if you have a family history then you need to be careful vitamin c these days is very very relevant extremely relevant because uh, of it helps to boost the immunity so we'll discuss the vitamins one by one quickly vitamin a is the first one and it is it is called retinol so you know immediately the retina is in the eye it is very important for a good eyesight uh, it is very important for uh, skin and uh, it is very important for the mucus lining and uh, in vegetarians in uh, in animal you know from non vegetarian foods it is present just as such in non uh, in vegetarian foods you have to uh, get beta carotene which is a precursor to vitamin a so four molecules of beta carotene will give you one molecule of vitamin a uh, beta carotene in vegetables is present in carrot papaya mango pumpkin apricot all the colored vegetables different colors and the deficiency of it causes night blindness now one uh, vegetable i'd like to talk about here is beetroot uh, you know and these some of these things which i am telling you in between are because of my experience 
uh, especially I've heard a lot of women in the gym who come, uh, they, they say that oh, I, oh, I'm anemic and I have to go home and I, after this, uh, my workout, I'll go and take uh, beetroot juice so that, you know, the blood directly goes, you know, the uh, red color juice directly goes into the blood and I feel strong. So that is an absolute misconception. The iron in beetroot is zero. There is no iron in beetroot. The red color is because of beta carotene. It's a color and it is, have, it is very rich in vitamin A. It is very good. It's a very good vegetable. It has got excellent fiber, but it does not have iron as a lot of people think. So uh, these are, um, I don't know, uh, I know many of you are trainers here and uh, if you have ever come across such a thing, but I will like to quote some of my experiences and myths uh, about things which, uh, you know, with talks that do the rounds so that you know what to say when you come across a case like that. Then vitamin D is uh, calciferol, uh, again, a fat soluble vitamin and goes without saying, we all know it is important for bones, gums and teeth and also making of so many hormones. Uh, the deficiency of vitamin D causes rickets and uh, you know, if it affects the mental health, it can cause mental disorders and confusion. It is present in egg yolk, and milk and it is present in inactive form under the skin. Now inactive form means when you sit in the sunlight you get vitamin D, it gets activated. Whatever it's there in an active form that will get activated but if you go out you know in the scorching sunlight you will have the damage from the ultraviolet rays and uh, that can be very extensive damage. It can cause cancer and cause a lot of damage. So what we want is actually the morning sun and that is why we say that the uh, early morning pranayams or Surya Namaskar uh, in the morning sun are very pleasant and can really energize you and strengthen you because the direct, one of the direct benefits you get is the activation of the inactive vitamin D under your skin. So, uh, you know, that uh, is one thing you can think of and then you have antioxidants. Um, uh, okay, what, why do we need antioxidants and what are antioxidants? Uh, when, you know, the oxygen molecule, first of all, has a valency of two. And um, so, you know, if the, the uh, you know, that in the form of radical, because it, is, it hasn't got a neutral number of electrons in its outermost shells. So it needs two more electrons to complete itself. So what happens is that two oxygen atoms bind to form one molecule of oxygen and they share, that's a covalent bond, when they share electrons uh, to form one single molecule of oxygen. Now, when you do very heavy and intense exercise, uh, especially aerobic exercise, when you, know, you consume a lot of oxygen, there is so much reaction that the oxygen atom, the molecule splits and two atoms are formed. Two actually free radicals are formed because now they are radicals because they don't have a neutral sufficient number of electrons. So they have a positive charge of two. Now to neutralize itself, one oxygen atom may take electrons from the adjacent atom. So when it takes electrons from the adjacent atoms, the atom in the cell organelle, that becomes a charge, that becomes a free radical. So now the second atom to neutralize itself will take electrons from the adjacent atom next to it. And so a chain reaction occurs and there is a kind of a domino effect. So we want to nip the evil in the bud. And what do antioxidants do? They, these oxygen uh, radicals that were present in the beginning, the antioxidants neutralize them in the very beginning. So when you take antioxidants, uh, especially they are abundant in fruits, vegetables, and uh, you know so many other uh, herbs, uh, they are having anti-aging properties. They prevent cancer, heart disease, premature aging, and a lot of damage, which is free radical damage. So um, it is good to take uh, post-workout. They are present in catechins in tea, in the green tea extract. Uh, vitamin C is a very, very good antioxidant. Vitamin E, very good antioxidant. Selenium is a micromineral which is needed. And fish oil, uh, coenzyme Q10 and resveratrol. Uh, I would like to quote a little bit about resveratrol here because 
that is present in red wine and that is also one thing uh, which people talk about a lot uh, people will come to you with this kind of doubt uh, that red wine is healthy and i can have it uh, the healthy thing it is still an alcohol it will still produce toxicity the very function of alcohol for enjoyment is to make you toxic uh, you're intoxicated and you enjoy that uh, bliss of ignorance so uh, if you are doing it for health reason, that's really silly. If you want to do it to get toxic and enjoy yourself and have the enjoy the bliss, that is your prerogative, absolutely. But if you're doing it for health reasons, then that is not justified because you can get the same resveratrol from dark chocolates, uh, especially unsweetened dark chocolates and as supplements and in red grapes. So that accounts for the resveratrol in the red wine. Now, the very important and very relevant one, and I like to talk about uh, this in the COVID days, is ascorbic acid, and that is vitamin C. Vitamin C is very important for immunity. In these days, you can take at least 1,000 mg a day. Uh, then it is, uh, and I will tell you why you should take a supplement uh, besides the, uh, you know, the natural sources. So uh, vitamin C, besides being an antioxidant, uh, it has a role also in the formation of collagen for the skin. It has a role in the uh, formation of the synovial fluid in the joint. It is important for mucus lining and the deficiency of vitamin C will cause scurvy. Okay, so now coming to the supplementation part. Now, so if you pluck a lime from a tree, the best time to have it is right at that time. Just pluck and have it because the moment you pluck the lime, the ascorbic acid in the lime will begin to get oxidized. So it starts getting oxidized and then it is taken to the wholesale, it is a market and then it is stored there. And then again, it's taken to the retail market. It may be stored there and then to your local vendor. And then you go all the way to the market, you buy it, you store it in your refrigerator. By the time you actually consume it, you know, you are paying for an urban lifestyle actually by the time you consume it, the ascorbic acid in that is diminished. So if you are taking something like a gooseberry, you know, which you call amla, if you're taking something like that, then what happens is that, uh, you know, the content in it is so high that by the time it reaches you, there is still something left in it. But otherwise, you're just getting the sour taste, you know, the khatta. You are not getting enough ascorbic acid as you are imagining. So in these days, it is very good to take a supplement and uh, so, you know, that is something which I wanted to tell you. And even if you feel that you're taking excess, being a water soluble vitamin, the excess will be eliminated. Then vitamin E is D-alpha tocopherol. The minimum amount of vitamin E you need uh, for your skin, for your nervous system, and as an antioxidant is 40 IU. But if you're doing physical activity, then you need at least 200 IU. You know, that is the difference. I'm quoting this because the moment you start physical activity, you can imagine the amount of supplementation you need. And if you're doing, you're a marathon runner or you do, you're a bodybuilder who is doing weight training, as well as, uh, you know, you are on supplements and you're doing cardio because you go on a low calorie diet. And this is a fat soluble vitamin. So I have seen people's, you know, their hands are shivering and so on, so it is needed for the metabolism of the nerves, and so it goes up to 600 IU also. But when you go to that level, uh, it should not be always, it, is, it should be in those days when your activity level is extremely high and your calories are low. Uh, a lot of people in their last days of competition, they get uh, the strength from the CNS, the central nervous system, because the actual you know, the calorie consumption is low and it is the reflex action and the CNS which is giving you the strength. Naturally, in natural form, it is present in green leafy vegetables, nuts, uh, almonds, pine nuts, wheat germ, apricot, and fish oil. Uh, then vitamin B is a, it's a water soluble vitamin. It's a, there's a bouquet of uh, vitamins in that. And B1 is thymine, B2 is riboflavin, B5 is pantothenic acid, B6 is pyridoxine, B12 is cobalamine, uh, then you have folic acid and biotin. Uh, cobalamine is very important for the uh, absorption and formation of hemoglobin. So if you're anemic and you have lots of iron, it's not going to help you unless and until you have B12. B12 is present in uh, non-vegetarian food just as such. But if you're a vegetarian, it will be synthesized by the microflora in the gut. 
and so many things happen in the gut, especially for vegetarians. You must make sure that you are taking a probiotic, uh, uh, you know, supplement or a probiotic food also, like yogurt, you know, curd. That's for probiotic food. So you just want to need to have something which has uh, got probiotic properties. Uh, folic acid is very important for pregnant women because it is important in cell division in bodybuilders. Uh, you, you know, folic acid is very important because you're looking for hyperplasia besides hypertrophy, you're looking for hyperplasia also. So uh, in cell division, uh, you are look, you have to have folic acid. Biotin is very important for the skin in all the supplements that are meant for hair, skin and nails. Uh, if you have something like alopecia areata, which is a uh, autoimmune disorder, say bald patches, you know, hair in the head, or you see your nails chipping off. Biotin is a very, very beneficial. I'm really telling you it works instantly. It's a very good supplement for people who have autoimmune disorders. And if they have any problem in the hair, skin and nails, biotin is a very good supplement. Uh, the deficiency of vitamin B will cause tingling of nerve and Chilosis. Chilosis is like your lips begin to get dry and there are cuts in that. Uh, so vitamin D is very important for uh, all the energy reactions. And, uh, you know, sometimes when you, would you lack vitamin B, you may take all the protein in the world and all the carbohydrate and you may still feel lethargic. So vitamin B is very important. Some people take niacin before workout because it also helps in the energy reactions. Uh, niacin may give you, you know, make you feel very flushed and red and it may uh, irritate you. So you need to be careful with that. And uh, if it's an isolated niacin supplement, that B3. And uh, so it is present naturally in cereals, oil seeds and nuts. Okay, so uh, then you come to minerals. Minerals are inorganic. Uh, so, you know, some are needed in higher quantities uh, and some are needed in very little quantities, but even they are very significant and very, very precious because they are important for the formation of, uh, you know, so many of your organs and tissues. Now, um, the import, the big ones, you know, are calcium. In all over your body, you have bones and your skeletal structure. That's the foundation. Uh, calcium, iron. Iron is for the blood. Again, you have it all over your body. Uh, sulfur and the electrolytes, sodium, chlorine, fluorine, uh, potassium, and magnesium. Magnesium is very important for the absorption of calcium and for soothing of the nerves. Uh, micronutrients are selenium, a very good antioxidant, molybdenum, and manganese cobalt, copper, silicon, and boron. These are the micronutrients. So we come to the first macronutrient and that is very, very precious and that is calcium. Calcium, we all know it is important for the formation of bone and teeth. Uh, it is important for muscle contraction. So when you go to the gym and you are doing your contractions, you know that it is the blood calcium that is helping you to contract the muscle. If there is no calcium, the muscle may not contract. Uh, it is important for maintaining heartbeat. So it has a life function, a very, very important life-saving function of blood clotting, which is very relevant. I'll especially talk about that. It stops lead from being absorbed by the bone. So if you ha don't have enough calcium, you know, lead is very, very toxic. So it stops uh, lead from being absorbed by the bone. It helps in the permeability of cell membrane. So the, the membrane of the cell allows certain things to go inside it and outside it. And that is controlled by the permeability. So it's a semi-permeable membrane and calcium has a very important role in that. And uh, it's also important for the protein structuring in DNA and RNA and in lowering of uh, cholesterol. So uh, I was coming to the blood clotting function. You know, uh, now if, if you get a cut in your body, you know, so calcium has a life saving function of blood clotting. If the blood does not clot, then obviously you are drained out of blood. So that is a life threatening condition and um, nature wants to protect you. And these functions are given the first priority the life saving, uh, you know, significant function. So, uh, you know, if your bone, bone calcium, uh, if your blood calcium level is very low, then again, osteoclast will become very active and calcium will be leached out of your bones to, you know, get the uh, blood calcium levels to normal, especially because of the blood clotting function. So you need to ensure that your blood calcium levels are 
optimum. And so that is one of the reasons, uh, I'll give you other reasons also, but this is one of the major reasons that you should get, especially if you're an athlete, you know, your nutrient demands, your biological pathways, how food is digested and stored and utilized in your body completely changes if you are athlete in any sport not just in bodybuilding, but in any sports, whether it's football or uh, tennis or squash or whatsoever, your body biochemical pathways really change. So you need to get your blood test done and uh, see it in that perspective. You know, sometimes their normal may not be the normal we have, uh, but you know, you just got to put it in perspective. So I, like I'll give you an example, being an athlete, uh, you know, sometimes my basal uh, heart rate, the pulse rate is low. So I once went in for a surgery and uh, what happened was that uh, during the surgery, my pulse rate went very low and the doctors were very, very scared. And uh, later, you know, they asked me, I mean, you were fine, but we were, we were thinking of giving you some medication. What really happened? So I told them, no, I'm an athlete. And then they said, you should have told this to us earlier because the pulse rate went so low for that. For them, it was dangerous, but for me, it was a normal thing. So even now when, when I'm asleep, you know, when I'm sleeping or I'm at rest, sometimes my pulse rate goes down to 48, 49, 50. So that happens and that's fine. So that's why I'm saying when you get your blood test done, there'll be many, many such things and you got to put it in perspective, especially if you are an athlete. Uh, the sources of calcium are uh, milk, ragi, dry dates, water chestnuts, uh, soya bean, dry fish, uh, colocasia leaves. Uh, so milk is always there. Uh, whenever you take any source of calcium, if you're having a supplement, then you know it will be fortified with magnesium, phosphorus, and vitamin D, because uh, you know that they are needed for absorption. But otherwise, it's a very good idea, especially if you don't have lactose intolerance. It's a very good idea to take a little bit of milk along with that, so that because the milk has got the enzymes to digest it. So if you just take calcium, you know it may just get excreted also. So you need to uh, take care of the absorption. And if you're doing, especially, you know, it will be, it will uh, be used for bone formation by the osteoblast only if you're giving the resistance to the bone, weight bearing exercises. Like in these days, uh, you know, we have the COVID situation. A lot of people are not able to go to the gym. So the, one of the primary worries, uh, especially for power lifters are that when they go back to the gym, the detraining effects actually come in in 72 hours. So if they suddenly go and lift that heavy weight, it can really harm the bones because you know the detraining effects, are, they have been giving the kind of resistance to the bone that has already uh, given them high uh, density in the bone. But if they go to the gym after a prolonged period of time and they suddenly start weight training uh, to the level that they were doing earlier, uh, then besides the soreness and inability to do, just putting all that aside because the muscle memory will get it back very quickly. Uh, you know, you need to be careful that you don't undergo any damage in your tendons and ligaments and bones. So uh, that is uh, the importance of weight training as far as uh, bone density and bone formation is concerned. Then you come to iron. Iron uh, is present in the form of Hemi iron and non hemi iron. Uh, non vegetarian ha foods have hemi iron, which is absorbed instantly, and non hemi iron, uh, you know, doesn't get absorbed very easily. You know, it takes, it is uh, very, very difficult to absorb. Uh, so, uh, you know, it has to be accompanied with B12 and vitamin C. Then uh, it is needed for hemoglobin as well as myoglobin. Now what hemoglobin does in the rest of the body, uh, myoglobin helps in the uh, transport of oxygen and nutrients in the muscle. And the deficiency of iron can cause anemia and laziness and lack of energy, obviously because uh, you are not having enough hemoglobin, so you do not get oxygen and uh, you know the nutrients to form that kind of strength in your muscles. Now, uh, here I want to talk about spinach. Now, spinach has non-hemi iron, so obviously, uh, you know, it is difficult to absorb. And on top of that, spinach has oxalates and phylates, which make it further difficult to absorb iron. So now if you think that spinach is going to give you a lot of iron, you really need to rethink on that. So you uh, have to be very particular when you come to hemoglobin. So if you are having such energy demands, it's a good thing to take supplements. Uh, I would like to talk about uh, marathon players here uh, because they, they, uh, their demand for, they have to do a very high endurance activity 
for a very, very prolonged period of time. So uh, since they are, uh, you know, they have to is run say 40, 42 kilometer at a very, very good speed, uh, they need their hemoglobin levels to be well maintained. So what some of them do is they go to high altitude regions, okay, where the oxygen levels are very low and they train there. So what happens is that the brain gives a signal to the bone marrow. Uh, actually, it gives a brain, the brain gives a signal to the kidneys. The kidney produces a hormone that stimulates the bone marrow to produce red blood cells, more red blood cells. So, you know, their red blood RBC count becomes very, very high. And then they come back to the plains, they rest. And when they go finally for their competition, they, you know, they are able to give optimal performance. Now, this is uh, something which is dangerous also. And when they are doing it at high altitude, when the oxygen levels are low, you know that even tourists are sometimes sent back when the oxygen levels are low. Uh, these athletes are highly conditioned and uh, they are doing it with heart rate monitors under medical supervision and under the uh, supervision of uh, very experienced coaches. So uh, this example I have given you just to put this in perspective and because you will know that uh, how the body adapts uh, to the demands and you know, if you are doing it in a learned and uh, you know, with people with, you know, you're conditioning your body to be able to do that uh, efficiently. Now, the most important nutrient, and that is water. Uh, we are 75% made of water, actually 55 to 75. Uh, in infancy, it's almost 80% water. Uh, water is important to keep you uh, well hydrated. It, is, uh, it regulates body temperature. It helps to carry nutrients to the cell. It helps to remove toxins. It helps you keep well hydrated and which is very important for so many chemical and enzymatic reactions. Uh, if you don't have enough water in your body, first of all, the sodium level will proportionately go high and that will cause increase in blood pressure. So a dehydrated condition will cause hypertension. The protoplasm in the muscle cell has water content. You know, the, it is made of water, the base is water. And so when you don't have enough water, the, they will lose water and so you have very poor muscle tone. So it will not look, make you look, you know, make you glow. And there will be difficulty in weight loss because there will be lactic acid formation. There is not sufficient water in your muscles. Uh, you will have asthma, allergies and migraines, joint pains, muscle pain, low energy, mental confusion. Uh, your stomach has hydrochloric acid and so if you uh, don't have enough water, it will damage the inner lining of the stomach and cause ulcer and that will cause stomach pain and even cramps. If you have low level of water in your body, the brain gives a signal to the body to hold the water, that there is no enough water, please hold water. So your body will hold water and that is actually water retention. So you will see that your feet will swell and uh, you know, if you want to get rid of uh, uh, water, you know, in the extracellular space, the bloating, then you need to take more water to remove water so that the brain is, you know, it's always the opposite. If you take more water, the brain will tell the body there is too much water, please eliminate. And that's how you get rid of water. And it keeps you well hydrated. So the water goes where it's really needed. So in your body, in the cells, there is one intracellular space and the, uh, the part outside the cell is the extracellular space. The intracellular space has potassium. The extracellular space has sodium. So uh, the intracellular space, uh, you know, if there is, if the water is less, then sodium is hygroscopic in nature. It attracts water. So what it will do when there is not enough water, it will attract water from the intracellular space. And that will come out, so there's the, you know, the uh, muscle cell, the cell will squeeze. And uh, what happens is that sometimes some potassium also comes to the extracellular space. When that happens, that is the time when you get muscle cramps. And we see so many bodybuilders on stage getting dehydrated. At that time, the body just locks. You have no choice, you know, it's just body gets stuck and they don't know what to do. So don't dehydrate yourself to that extent. 
uh, you must consume a little bit of water. It's not going to make that huge a difference to the body when you see the body from the stage when the judges are watching. And I'm telling you that being a, an IFBB international judge, uh, it is you don't need to go to that extent. You need to be uh, good in your posing. You need to smile. There is a presentation part, which is so important. Uh, then if you're really dehydrated, you would like to substitute with water which is a hypotonic drink and not a isotonic drink. So what is a hypotonic drink and what is an isotonic drink? A hypotonic drink is something which has very less electrolytes. Isotonic drinks is given to sports person who lose a lot of electrolytes when they are playing on the field. So, uh, you know, because they more need to substitute the electrolytes. So that sodium is one of the electrolytes. If you give uh, an isotonic drink with a lot of electrolyte to a person who is dehydrated, then in the intestine itself, sodium being hygroscopic, hygroscopic means it attracts water. So sodium being hygroscopic in nature will attract the water from the blood. It will pull out more water from the blood and actually dehydrate you even more. So you don't want to give an isotonic drink to, an, uh, to a person who is dehydrated. You'd rather give a hypotonic and a cool hypotonic drink. Warm water gets, uh, takes time to absorb. Cool water gets absorbed very quickly. So a cool hypotonic drink to a person who is dehydrated. Uh, creatine uh, is a supplement. Now I'll talk about a few supplements, you know. Um, creatine, uh, as I told you in the beginning, I started with the energy system uh, that uh, there is creatine phosphate in the cells and this uh, replenishes the phosphate radical to the adenosine diphosphate uh, so that it forms adenosine triphosphate and gives you energy and prolongs uh, your uh, one rep max also. And so uh, it gives you strength and it is present in non-vegetarian foods like fish, tuna, and salmon, but in vegetarians, it is synthesized. Uh, now, creatine is also hygroscopic in nature, again. So, uh, you know, if when, when it is in the intracellular space, it has to get into the cell. Once it gets into the cell, you know, you will feel that pump. You, you, your body you will get pumped when you are taking creatine. But besides that, it is giving you strength to, do, to prolong your uh, high intensity training. And so it helps, you know, in the long run to give you, uh, you know, it improves your strength and your performance. There are two ways of taking creatine. One way is that you do a loading phase and then you do a maintenance phase. So when you do a loading phase, you take for the first five days, you take 20 grams of creatine per day. And women also, I would like to just add this line here, the women should not uh, move away from uh, creatine. It's a very good uh, supplement to take. And uh, so 20 grams of creatine for the first five days. And uh, in the, how you should take it is that 10 grams you take in the morning and 10 grams after your workout. And I'll give you a reason why it should be taken after workout uh, and not before that. Uh, so that is the, the you know, the five, then after that, after you completed your loading phase for five days, 20 grams a day, you do five grams of maintenance dose for one month. And then you stop, you give a break. Uh, the other way of taking it is just take five grams a day for 60 days, that's it. But the loading phase and the maintenance phase uh, method is, has been seen to be much more effective and efficient. Now, if you're taking creatine, you should take a lot of water, a sufficient amount of water. Uh, one of the reasons is that you do not want bloating, you know, because uh, uh, it is hygroscopic in nature. And if you are not using creatine, if you're not doing your workouts in those days, then it is better to avoid it because if you're doing it, it's excellent. It will uh, increase your strength and really help you a lot. It will go a very long way. It's an excellent supplement. I must rehydrate. But if you are not doing your workout, then this creatine will be converted into creatinine, which is done by the kidneys, and it is unnecessary work for the kidneys. So if you're not taking, doing that heavy kind of work, uh, exercise, then, it, then you can avoid creatine in those days. Uh, then, okay, now there are two more forms of creatine besides the conventional creatine monohydrate, uh, which is pref still preferred by the old school uh, people. And you know that uh, old school things always work. They're tried and tested. 
But uh, the problem with creatine monohydrate is that some of it remains in the extracellular space. And being hygroscopic in nature, it can attract water and it can cause, it can make you look bloated. Now that is only, that only happens in those days, uh, you know, when you're taking creatine, but if you're looking for a long-term goal to give you strength, then it's fine, you know. It's not, it's just not going to increase your fat. You may see your weight gain on the weighing scale, but it is not going to increase your fat. It's, it's going to go. And if you're having enough amount of water, then that's going to get eliminated anyways. So that's with creatine ethyl ester. That is a form of creatine that completely goes inside the cell. So you will not see any bloating because there will be nothing in the extracellular uh, fluids. Then you have buffer creatine that helps to maintain the alkaline balance. So if you, you know, since the lactic acid formation will not be there, you will not fatigue very quickly. These are the claims made by the companies who sell uh, creatine, ethyl ester and buffer creatine. But, uh, you know, we still, uh, you know, old school people, we still stick to creatine monohydrate and it's a very, very good supplement. Uh, then why it should not be taken before workout? That is because a creatine helps to lower the blood sugar. So if you lower your blood sugar before your workout, then you, know, you will not have optimum strength and energy for your workout. And it should be taken after your workout. Another reason for that is that a creatine needs insulin to get inside the cell. So after your workout, as it is, I advised earlier that you must take a high glycemic index carbohydrate because that will get the protein and all the other nutrients right away into your cell and replenish your muscle glycogen. That's the time you need high glycemic index carbohydrate. That's the time your insulin should go high and creatine will uh, get absorbed along with that. So it's really the best time. What creatine you take and that gets deposited as creatine phosphate in the cell will be utilized the next day in your heavy strength workouts. Uh, the next uh, supplement is uh, nitrogen oxide. Nitrogen oxide helps to uh, dilate your blood vessels. So it's a hemodilator and uh, it helps because you know the blood vessels dilate. So sufficient amount of blood and nutrients will reach the muscles. So since sufficient amount of nutrients, oxygen, everything is reaching the muscles with the uh, you know, hemoglobin in the blood, uh, it will facilitate muscle recovery, muscle growth. It will improve your strength and endurance because the quality of muscle regrowth recovery is uh, happening and it will give you a perpetual pump. Now, when you take arginine, arginine, you know, it breaks down and um, it releases nitrogen oxide. Arginine is very good, uh, you know, for you, but uh, it should not be taken in very high doses, in extremely high doses. It can cause toxicity. Uh, my advice to you is to cycle it. And also you can take, when you're doing it, you can take three grams, that is 3000 mg, uh, along with leucine and N-acetylcysteine. Leucine, because leucine, as I told you about leucine earlier, it is the key to muscle synthesis. Whatever you're taking uh, will help in the formation of where it is targeted. And acetylcysteine is uh, a precursor to the master antioxidant in the liver that is glutathione. So glutathione, so whatever toxicity is produced in any case will be neutralized by the glutathione. And so the N-acetylcysteine uh, is the precursor to that. A lot of uh, film actresses you would hear would, will be taking glutathione for a better complexion and they think that they will become fair, but being fair or dark or the color of skin actually really depends on your genetics and uh, it's a number of genes. It's a quantitative gene uh, decision, but uh, definitely it will, how it helps to improve the, uh, the complexion is because, uh, you know, it, the, uh, it, just the glow and the clarity in the skin because glutathione is a very good antioxidant. So that helps in that sense also. Uh, then uh, the recovery, you know, for, for recovery, very good uh, supplement. And I've already spoken about a bit uh, earlier, that is glutamine. It is anti-catabolic in nature. And uh, during your exercise, a large amount of glutamine uh, would be consumed, uh, sometimes oxidized especially in men, it happens more in men. It is the most abundant uh, 
amino which is present in the body and so and uh, it gets uh, depleted and oxidized also quickly if if you have if you lack glycogen so it is very important for immunity and that is why it is very important to replenish it as well uh, in you know in food it is present in fish meat poultry beans and protein powders and but when a post workout it is very good to uh, supplement it with uh, a special uh, you know a specific uh, glutamine supplements if especially if you are doing high intensity training and the same same happens with the branch chain amino acids which are very essential and they are anti catabolic in nature and essential in the sense especially because body cannot synthesize them they need they are needed not only just for themselves you know they help in the synthesis of so many other protein chains also and so when liver <laughs> glycogen is depleted they can be used for energy they can be taken pre workout and intra workout one very good time to take bca is before sleeping so i told you one is uh, casein that you can take if you feel hungry but if you're not hungry and you still you feel that you might get into catabolic state if you've done a heavy workout in that day and you're in a negative calorie balance you don't want to lose lean muscle you want to lose fat uh, especially if you're into bodybuilding and at that time you might need to go into a negative calorie balance that is the time when you must take a uh, branch chain amino acid before you sleep that's not going to keep you full but that's definitely going to uh, supplement the need and fulfill the need and keep a positive nitrogen balance uh, so we come to a few fat burners now uh, one significant fat burner which uh, people don't talk about much i don't know why and that is chitosan uh, it is made from exoskeletons of animals crustaceans crabs and what it does is that it binds with the fats and eliminates them so it uh, you know it while it prevents uh, bad fats or trans fats to and you know it cuts your calories uh, drastically the problem is that it will not let good fats and essential fatty acids also to get absorbed which is so important and so it will also not let fat soluble vitamins get absorbed so the uh, adek now these uh, essential fatty acids and adek Uh, they are you know uh, they are uh, already stored in the body so for some time if you really want to cut calories you can take chitosan but you cannot uh, you know let it go for a very prolonged period of time uh, the second uh, supplement which is uh, advertised a lot on internet these days and that is garcinia cambogia it's a very good supplement uh, it is a fruit actually it's uh, malabar tamarind and it blocks the body's ability to make fat lipogenesis it prevents lipogenesis and it suppresses uh, appetite so you know it kind of controls your total calorie intake and you know it will not uh, let you do any binge eating and even if you have eaten something it will prevent the uh, formation of fats and storage of fat uh if you are going to go for a party and you think that you might consume too much of carbohydrate rich diet uh which uh, ideally you should not you should have your self control in place but sometimes in social situations where you cannot avoid or you know you are traveling outside and you have no choice but you know to have it at that time one very good supplement that you can carry with you is alpha lipoic lipoic acid ala Uh, that helps in the breakdown of carbohydrate and uh, in helps in energy metabolism so if you take around 300 to 600 mg of ala uh, before you are uh, uh, you know uh, half an hour or an hour before you're going to have your food that will help in the breakdown of the carbohydrate in case you're going to take it in excess uh, l carnitine is a very good fat burner it is uh, synthesized in the body naturally by lysine and methionine they are essential amino acids and uh, this helps in the transportation of fats to mitochondria and so it facilitates my mitochondrial function and uh, production of energy then uh, the next fat burner is chromium picolinate it has a uh, few very good functions that it helps in lowering blood sugar by improving insulin uh, sensitivity it helps in chromium deficiency and while you know women some of the women who have pcod 
uh, chromium picolinate is a very good supplement because uh, it also uh, you know helps to control mood swings and depression and it lowers the cholesterol levels it aids weight loss by preventing binge eating binge eating means you've been hungry for very long and then you feel you know controlled yourself for such a long time that you're so desperate and you're so low energy from within that when you get an opportunity you immediately want to uh, eat too much you overeat and that is very detrimental because that will you know immediately be converted into fat so it prevents binge eating and uh, you know why old people they they wake up many times at night and uh, so they need to have good night's sleep. Chromium helps, you know, to maintain a stable, uh, prolonged period of sleep. Uh, so, you know, you can get into your sleep cycles, the deep cycle, the REM and then NREM uh, cycles. <coughs> You know, so the REM is the rapid eye movement cycle. It helps in all the phases of uh, sleep cycle. Then uh, CLA, you know, is conjugated linoleic acid and it is a good fat. It reduces body fat by increasing the amount of specific enzymes and proteins that are involved in fat breakdown. It, uh, so it dissolves fat also and helps to eliminate the bad fat. It is present in beef and dairy. Uh, you know, so a lot of people say that, you know, ghee is very good for reducing fat and how does it happen is it's supposed to ideally have conjugated linoleic acid, but it is present more in grass fed cows, which you don't see these days. Uh, the, you know, in some of the Western countries, cows still eat grass. So they have their fat has good amount of CLA, but in India, they are eating more of grain these days. And it's a kind of uh, omega-6 technically. Uh, so it has the double bond in the sixth carbon atom from the omega side. And the dosage of it is three to four grams a day. Uh, so now, uh, one of the questions was, I hope I can, uh, you know, I, I hope I'm not going beyond time. I'll try to complete very soon and uh, take a few questions. Uh, I'll just try to half fasten it and you can come back to me with any number of questions. You're absolutely open to that. I re truly respect that you all are here with me today. Um, then the, the, you know, I had a question about thermogenic fat burners. Uh, especially the hydroxycut and somebody had asked me. And so uh, that has high dosage of caffeine. Now, uh, caffeine, uh, I will talk about caffeine in particular. Uh, it, uh, it has got, uh, you know, it helps fat burning. Uh, it facilitates it. It doesn't help it per se, but it facilitates the pathways. And how it does, I will talk about it earlier, but the problem with caffeine is that, you know, you can, you can uh, you know, become tolerant to it very quickly. So after a certain time, uh, you know, your body adapts to it and the caffeine becomes ineffective. So uh, over a period of time, you must, that is the reason, one of the reasons why you should cycle it. Why you should cycle hydroxycut is because hydroxycut uh, can be a problem if it is raising your heart rate. You know, uh, earlier, uh, hydro I didn't want to talk about it, but I'll just mention it, uh, that it used to have a chemical called ephedra. And ephedra immediately has negative effects on the uh, ECG itself directly. Uh, so it's a banned substance and that is the problem with uh, caffeine. Now there are newer versions of hydroxycut that are coming which have herbs uh, like the ladies mantle extract, the wild olive extract and the congen seeds extract and the wild mint. So these uh, herbs, they help to uh, you know, they uh, raise the metabolism and also the, they suppress anything that is, uh, uh, you know, preventing the norepinephrine from uh, working on the adrenergic receptors. They are the ones, the receptors, the adrenergic receptors are the ones which facilitate uh, the fat burning, lipolysis. So if, you know, you just need to understand that these uh, help in improving the pathways for fat burning. So, and the fat burning by hydroxycut has seen only in ideal placebo conditions. Placebo means that while experimentation, everything is ideal uh, because the real life conditions are different. So if you take excess uh, of uh, hydroxycut, especially in the evening times, you'll not be able to sleep well. And uh, in some people, it can cause anxiety, diarrhea, uh, jitteriness, and insomnia, I already mentioned. So you must, uh, if, if at all you're taking it, then there are caffeine-free versions that are coming now, and those also, you can cycle it. So uh, weight loss, you know, per se is a, um, it's a marathon race, you know, it's not a, a one-time thing that you lose weight. It's a lifelong process. 
even if you're not competing, even if you just, uh, you know, want to, uh, you know, you're, you're taking a break, absolute break. What happens is that whatever you're eating, your body learns to metabolize it. Your bo body learns the pathway. Your body knows what you want. If I'm eating a carbohydrate or if I'm stopping to eat carbohydrate, uh, everything else in me is going to signal my brain and my mind and the gut that this is how I need it to be utilized. So even if you suppose you'd start taking uh, milk, you want to start taking milk. The first day you take a lot of milk, you will develop lactose intolerance and you'll not be well. And milk is a normal food, food substance. There's nothing wrong with milk. So everything you need, you're actually teaching your body. So even when you're eating something, you're teaching your body to form biological uh, pathways. So uh, it's like fat burning is like a marathon race. It's a long term uh, plan that you need to make. You're teaching your body, you're conditioning your body, you're conditioning your mind, you're teaching your brain, you're teaching your pituitary gland, uh, what weight you want to maintain. So it should be an ongoing process all the time. Every day when you monitor yourself, you check your weight, you check your uh, body, you know, in every morning, how your body is looking, you pose, uh, you know, you, you, you start understanding which foods and how, what portion size, what, how many grams of uh, this or that food will help you to get the best result. So over a period of time, you will start understanding yourself so much that you will get the hang of it and you will not need to think so much. So that's why I say that uh, you know, uh, fat burners are very good and I am going to tell you fat burning stacks and all that, but you know, they should be used only to support what you're doing, but the primary, uh, you know, thing should be your, your diet and your workout. Uh, regarding mass gainers, mass gainers have protein, carbohydrate and fat and uh, without workout, if you're not working out and just taking fat burners, it's just going to turn into fat. So when you want to gain fat, suppose there's a person who is uh, ectomorph and is very desperate to uh, gain weight, then he should concentrate on his uh, developing his fast twitch muscle fibers, uh, less repetitions and heavier workload weights, and also the other exercises to support that, you know, your tendons, ligaments, uh, stretching should be strong. If you keep doing heavy workouts, then you know you will have wear and tear and injury. And again, it should be a long-term process uh, you fuel yourself with natural carbohydrates and lean protein rather than uh, mass gainers. I personally feel that if you're not training that much and you're not having that many uh, calories, unless and until you know, you're know you reaching a calorie deficit because you're not able to, because of your practicality of the circumstances, you're not able to get yourself meal. I think it's better still to take lean protein and natural carbohydrates with low glycemic index and let your body grow uh, slowly over a period of time. That's my opinion. Uh, so now uh, fat burning stack here and uh, while you may do everything and get lean, you may or your whole body may be lean all over, but there will be some points like the lower abs or in men and the love handles or the uh, butts and thighs in women where you may not lose fat. And uh, that, that is where you have a greater concentration of something called the alpha-2 receptors. Uh, adrenaline in the body refers to the excitatory catecholamines and they are epinephrine and norepinephrine. Epinephrine and norepinephrine help in lipolysis. Lipolipids, lysis is breakdown. In the breakdown of lipids, it is the epinephrine and norepinephrine that help in that. Uh, they are the hormones and you can visualize them as uh, keys and they work on adrenergic receptors, which are, you can think of them as logs. So the adrenergic receptors are alpha-1 and beta-1, beta-2, beta-3, and even alpha-2. They are, they are the adrenergic receptors and they are the logs. We want the hormones, epinephrine and norepinephrine, to work on them and open these logs. The hormones are the key and these are the logs. Uh, the alpha-1 and beta-1, beta-2, beta-3 are uh, help in lipolysis. Alpha-2 is the enemy. It is anti-lipolytic. If you want uh, the uh, fatty acids to, so wherever you have more of alpha-2, you know, you will have stubborn fat. So if you want uh, fatty acids to break, uh, then, you know, lipolysis must occur. So they will break in the adipose tissue where the fat is stored and they will be carried to the active tissue for oxidation. 
So there are five supplements in this tax, which I tell you, and it really, really works. And I will get you, will give you the reasons for that. The first supplement is uh, Yohim bean. It is an alpha two receptor antagonist. So we want to uh, quieten and shut the working of the alpha two receptor. We want to blunt it. So Yohim bean does that. So if once the alpha two has been shut down, then the other adrenergic receptors, that is the alpha one and the beta receptors, uh, they, will, uh, they will start working and so lipolysis will occur. So the fat breaking will occur. And then yohimbin also helps in flow of blood. So these free fatty acids, you know, the fa uh, fatty acid is, uh, you know, it's present as triglyceride, one glycerol and three free fatty acids. So the free fatty acids, once they break, they will be free and they will flow with the blood from the adipose tissue to the active tissue. Uh, then the second, uh, uh, supplement is caffeine. As I told you, I'll come back to caffeine. Uh, caffeine is from a family of methylxanthines. It helps uh, in cognitive performance and is a CNS stimulant. CNS is the central nervous system. Uh, it has a specific significance. Uh, I think I spoke about it, but I'll say this one more time, that when bodybuilders are you know, very close to competition, they are on very low calories, they are still able to do one rep max and heavy training. And that is because of the CNS, the strength they get from the mind. And that is where caffeine helps a lot. It uh, helps you to focus. It helps you to improve your cognitive performance. And you can really do with all the inner strength your exercises. Now, uh, there are adenosine receptors which prevent the functioning of norepinephrine. And as I said, norepinephrine is needed for lipolysis to help the lipolysis um, then to stimulate the adrenergic receptors. So adenosine receptor, uh, caffeine is an adenosine receptor antagonist, and it also blunts the functioning of PDE, that is phosphodiesterase. So when these two are blunted, then lipolysis can occur freely because norepinephrine, norepinephrine works. And uh, so norepinephrine works on the alpha one and the beta receptors and the fatty acids will break. The next supplement is the Alcar, A-L-C-A-R, uh, acetylated L-carnitine. Uh, it is uh, antioxidant, anti-aging, it is cardioprotective and cognitive enhancing. It helps to transport free fatty acids to the mitochondria. So now you see you had in Yohimbin had shut the alpha-2 receptors and caffeine had shut the uh, phosphodiesterase and the adenosine receptors. It is already giving you a good uh, workout. Now the free fatty acids that had broken were carried in the blood to the active tissue. Now from there, it has to be taken to the mitochondria because the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell and that is where uh, fats are oxidized and energy is produced. It's a powerhouse of the cell where the energy is generated. It's like a generator. So uh, that it happens. So it has to be these uh, free fatty acids need to be taken to the mitochondria and that is done by Alcar. So, it, so you get energy and your exercise performance is improved. The next supplement is the green tea extract. The active ingredient in green tea is the EGCG. It has a thermogenic effect. Now this also has a thermogenic effect. Already you were taking caffeine. This too has a, a bit of that, but it's not that intense. And EGCG does another thing by decreasing the dietary fat absorption. And it also helps to suppress appetite. And also the last function that it has is it inhibits uh, the functioning of COMT, that is catechoomethyl transferase. Uh, because, and uh, that is something which also affects the functioning of norepinephrine. So you can see that, you know, if you have an enemy and you attack only from one side, uh, that enemy will uh, fizzle out here and there, and it will start working and attacking you in different ways and inhibiting you from doing your work. But if you have a multi-pronged approach and you are, you are attacking from all sides, then the, the, the fat has no choice but to get oxidized and go away. The last supplement is the sesame. Sesame is a lignan that is isolated from sesame seeds. Sesame is the till that we have in India in our homes, and it is a lignan. 
Lignan means it's an uh, entity which uh, and it combines, it's a molecule which combines with another entity and activates it. And here uh, it activates, the sets mean it activates the PPAR alpha. The full form just for you is peroxisome profilator activator receptor alpha. It is highly expressed in muscle, liver, kidney, heart, and is involved in the regulation of fat metabolism. Now this increases the gene expression of fatty acid oxidation enzymes and decreases the expression of lipogenic enzymes. So we don't want lipogenesis and therefore sesamine acts in two ways. It increases fat oxidation and it decreases fat storage. Uh, now quickly, the ginseng, uh, ginseng it's, it's not a fat burner, but uh, you know, we speak a lot about, it's heard a lot about uh, because it's uh, relative to, uh, related to workouts. It improves your energy level and strength and it stimulates physical and mental activity if you're feeling weak and tired. Now these, I'm, I'm going to talk to you about ginkgo. So these two supplements, if you have worked in the office the entire day, and you know, you are tired. That happens to me also, you know, when I'm working, uh, you know, in different ways, in different fields, professions, I also do Bharat Natyam. I go to a Natya Le and then I have to commute. And there is so much of this, the physical activity may not be so much, but there is CNS fatigue. You get tired internally. Even if you're sitting in one place, you're reading a book for five hours. You're doing office work, desktop work. You get so fatigued that now you don't have strength to exercise. And that is the biggest problem with all office goers. You know you have time. And you know, we write motivational quotes on Facebook and Instagram that one hour is just this much percent of your day and you know, there are no excuses. And it's very easy to say, but for a person who's just been studying, uh, he feels that, what do I do? I am tired. I, I am very fatigued mentally, physically. At that time, these supplements help a lot. Uh, so that is uh, ginseng. It improves cognitive function. It has anti-inflammatory effect. It is also important in erectile dysfunction. So for, uh, you know, for males, for men uh, in their uh, sexual life, and in, it is important for prevention of flu, and it helps to lower blood sugar. And the dosage is 200 to 400 mg. So that uh, is a very good supplement. And ginkgo biloba is a leaf. Uh, it helps to improve uh, blood circulation in brains, eyes, and ears. It is helpful in al Alzheimer's disease, cognitive functions, ADHD, hearing loss, autism. I'd just like to mention I, my son has autism. I have given him uh, ginkgo biloba, biloba for many years when he was uh, young. Uh, of course, now it's, he doesn't need it, fortunately, now. And it has many potent oxy antioxidants which fight uh, inflammation. And uh, the dosage is 120 to 240 mg for four to six weeks. And it should not be taken by diabetic patients. And it has got antioxidants called uh, flavonoids. Now, uh, so one of the last things here is metabolic syndrome that I just spoke about because I've been asked that. And it is closely linked to overweight or obesity and inactivity. So uh, this is a purely a lifestyle thing, unless and until you have the, the genetic disposition to insulin uh, uh, you know, resistance. Uh, in people with insulin resistance, these cells don't, uh, they don't respond to insulin. So insulin is actually the hormone which gets the nutrients or glucose inside the cell. That is why diabetic patients, you know, they lose weight uh, because they are not, they, you know, they keep losing weight because the muscle glycogen is not getting, uh, for, uh, you know, uh, replenished and they are, their muscles become so weak that their skin becomes loose and they lose a lot of muscle mass. So they, you know, they lose a lot of weight also, but that's not a good thing to happen. So the, now since the insulin is not, they're not responding to insulin and the glucose is not getting inside the cell, the blood sugar rises very much. And uh, so it, it, blood sugar becomes so high. So as a result, uh, you know, your body keeps producing more and more insulin, but your uh, cells do not respond to it. And so, uh, you know, your blood sugar just remains high and doesn't, uh, it's not effective. And that causes the metabolic uh, syndrome also. Now, uh, it depends on uh, age, if you have a genetic disposition for it. If you are having obesity and you're having too much uh, fat around the abdomen, then also you are prone to that. 
and uh, you are more likely to have metabolic syndrome if you have diabetes that I've already explained. And if you have ever had a non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, non-alcoholic, I say, because people who take alcohol, they know the reason why they're having uh, fatty liver. But if you're having it without any indulgence uh, as such, then, then that means you have a genetic disposition for that. Liver is uh, important for the metabolism of glucose. And if you're still having a fatty liver, definitely that is going to be affected. And also in case of polycystic ovary syndrome. So the prevention of it, there is, uh, you have to just commit yourself to a healthy lifestyle forever. And you have to do physical activity all the time. Eat plenty of fresh fruit, vegetables, lean protein and whole grains. And you must not take too much of saturated fat or too much of salt. And smoking is absolutely no. Okay, now uh, ketogenic diet. Oh my God, I see people so emotional about ketogenic diet these days. You know, everybody wants magic. They, you know, everybody likes Harry Potter. Nobody wants Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein is so, so boring. You know, I wish I could come to my uh, dining table and say abracadabra and get a good breakfast. But unfortunately, you got to go to the grocery store, you got to get the groceries, you got to store them, you got to cook, you got to have your meal and clean your dishes, which is not good at all. So people who take alcohol and they take all sorts of sugary foods and then suddenly they find some great, great ketogenic diet, they feel that that is you know, a magic pill that they have discovered. They can continue to indulge in butter chicken endlessly, not take any carbohydrate at all. And if you tell them that you are wrong, they get actually emotional about it that, oh my God, I had found something nice. And this woman tells me that it is not good at all. Uh, she is so horrible. What happens is in ketogenic diet, you have to go on a very low carb diet and uh, you know, extremely low carb, and you get yourself into a state of ketosis. What happens that when you stop carbohydrate initially, initially, you know, you will get over it, but initially you get something called a keto flu. So ketones are, uh, you know, they are they are formed because of as a byproduct of breakdown of uh, gluconeogenesis, you know, for fat, and then uh, ketones are burned for energy. They are used for energy. So the keto in keto flu, you have weakness, headache, irritability, nausea, vomiting, uh, constipation, because especially because uh, you don't have carbohydrates, there is no fiber. And uh, ketones, there's a tendency for ketones to get removed from body because of frequent urination, and that can uh, cause loss of electrolytes. And so because of the dehydration, you will have flu-like symptoms. What happens is that when you go, go start getting into the ketosis, uh, you will crave for sugar and then you will have brain fog and you will find it difficult to concentrate because the preferred source for brain is only and only carbohydrate. So this flu lasts for about a week and the, electro, the loss of electrolyte can cause kidney damage and kidney stones and also in turn cardiac arrhythmia. And due to the impracticality, you may tend to do yo-yo dieting. Now, what is yo-yo dieting? That you first you stop something completely, and then you have too much of it. So, if you have taken, uh, you have not taken carbohydrate at all, and then you you will suddenly tend to take a lot of carbohydrate because you're missing it. And once you say, "Oh, let go," and then you will you just give up. So, it can cause bad breath irregular menstrual cycle, decreased bone density and sleep issues. And, uh, you know, because of the high fat, your cholesterol may raise, uh, you will, your body will forget the metabolic pathways and to metabolize carbohydrates. So when you finally come back to carbohydrate, it will not be metabolized properly. And then you, I see a lot of people who lose fat uh, because of ketogenic diet initially, later on, they all have big bellies and, uh, there is no fiber, no fruit, veget no vegetables, and that can also affect the pathways of the medication that you're taking. So if you're already on a medication, you must consult a doctor. Uh, you must consume a lot of water if you are taking, uh, you're on a ketogenic diet. I have done ketogenic diet once post-surgery because I was not working out at all. It was just a trial. If you are very close to a competition, you suddenly decide to do a competition or a photo shoot, there is no other way. You can attempt it, but I always advise to do it with a balanced diet and 
work in the long term rather than all these fat diets. Fat diets are fat diets. Nothing can place a simple, nothing can substitute or replace a simple balanced diet. You must, you must concentrate on your relationship with your food, your emotional relationship with your food. Actually not have any emotions at all. When you look at the plate, you should look at carbohydrate, proteins, fat, and you should know that this is going to nourish me to do this, 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 this activity. Not that it's a delectable cuisine or what I want to have because I just want to feel better. Your work, your life and uh, how well you explore your potential and learn and you know your serious life goals which give you intrinsic and satisfaction and uh, fulfill your need of self-actualization. That should give you happiness, not the taste of your food. If you uh, are on a ketogenic diet, you may lose bone mass, bone density, muscle mass, lean mass, mass. And you know, if you, because carbohydrate is hygroscopic in nature, when you stop carbohydrate, then you know, you will lose a lot of water. So you don't know whether you are actually losing uh, bone density or water weight or muscle mass. You don't know that. So you think that on the weighing scale, you're getting very good result and it makes you very happy. So, you know, you people, you know, they, because of the initial results, uh, people get very, very attracted to fat diets and they think that they have discovered a magic pill. One of the benefits of ketogenic diet is that it reduces seizures. So it's good for people, but that also needs to be cycled. When you're on a ketogenic diet, uh, there will be days, reloading days, when you will have to take high amount of carbohydrate. Otherwise, you know, ketoacidosis, it can also cause, uh, it can be fatal also if you're just doing it uh, endlessly. It can be fatal. Uh, intermittent fasting. Now, one of the uh, things how human body has evolved is that when you, uh, when you were evolving, uh, you know, the Paleolithic man and when the food gatherer and hunter was there, uh, there, were, uh, there was no security. You didn't have a refrigerator to store your food. You didn't have markets. You didn't have agriculture. Man depended on his luck to find food. And so whenever there was no food available, but there were long periods of starvation, what used to happen was that the body would, the cortisol levels would raise and the body would go in a state of emergency in starvation mode and your body would st stop, uh, start uh, uh, depositing fat. Whatever is there will be converted into fat because body has gone into a state of emergency. So if you're doing intermittent fasting, your blood sugar, especially your diabetic, it's very dangerous. It can lower the blood sugar significantly. It can cause weakness. And it is very bad for breastfeeding women, pregnant women, diabetic people, as their blood sugar may go dangerously low. So whenever you're doing that, yes, fasting, you know, it detoxifies. Even fiber will detoxify your gut. You need to be careful with what you're doing. I don't mind if you're trying it once in a while. Fasting sometimes is good. But if you're going to substitute it with the fruit juices, you should know that you are just taking a lot of fruit sugar and that is, uh, you know, uh, that is just it's a high glycemic index sugar that can uh, affect you a lot negatively. Uh, then there is risk of bulimia in intermittent fasting. Bulimia is that when you do binge eating, you know, if you stay hungry for a very long time, it's an eating disorder. A lot of girls don't eat for a very, very prolonged period. And then suddenly they eat a lot. So uh, that is bulimia and then they may vomit and then whatever they eat is uh, stored as uh, fat. Uh, it can raise the cortisol level. And if you really want to do it, that time you can spend listening to music and meditating if you just want to go through that period. Uh, you can get dehydrated and irritable. So don't do prolonged uh, intermittent fast. Don't do it too often. The idea of healthy eating is to grow stronger and build your relationship with food. Uh, I'm very sorry. I just wanted to say all these things and uh, I have uh, taken more time. And uh, if you, uh, I don't know if this is, uh, it's okay with you all. Uh, you can ask me any questions and I would like to repeat here that you can write to me at ritasingh76 at hotmail.com. Uh, my Instagram ID is, uh, I, initially I was not active on social media messages. But now I try to catch up as much as possible. Uh, so Rita Jarrett, R-I-T-A-J-A-I-R-A-T-H underscore uh, IFBB Pro. Uh, you can message me and uh, you can also uh, 
you know you all have my phone number you can message me uh, but pardon me if i don't uh, reply instantly i am involved in uh, several activities so i may take uh, you know a day or so but i may not re reply immediately but i always reply and i consider it my uh, sacred duty to reply to people who have entrusted me today uh, yes uh, function of calcium there are several functions which i already told you um, the main function of uh, the primary function of calcium is bone building uh, this is from sunny uh, the, the primary function of bone building is uh, uh, you know the uh, calcium uh, the bone building and muscle building and then of course it, yes muscle contraction is a very important function of that uh, 100 gram of white rice with one scoop of whey and five grams of, uh, yes, that's a good choice, yes, because uh, white rice is a uh, high glycemic index carbohydrate and you, if you can keep it post-workout. Uh, your uh, email ID in the chat. Okay, I'll write it again. Uh, all right, Rita, S-I-N-G-H-76 at... Uh, hotmail.com that's my email id i have uh, oh i'm sorry it's not two it's the it's uh it's at the rate uh any other questions any other questions um, uh, hello. Yes, yes. Definitely. I'm from Ahmedabad. Okay. Um, I'm asking about uh, uh, what is the balanced uh, diet and what is the ratio of uh, general populations and uh, animal survivals of uh, person? What survivors? Person. <clears throat> no, you said some survivor. Just uh, general public, you're saying. General public, yes. Yes, uh, so uh, it is good to have 30% uh, of, uh, you see, uh, you know, your total calorie, I don't generally uh, uh, talk about it like that. I would like to uh, have a total, uh, you know, uh, energy expenditure, and then that is uh, calculated with the resting energy expense, uh, expenditure plus the physical activity level. And for okay. athletes, we uh, add the thermic uh, effect of activity. But, uh, you know, for uh, generally, if you, you must have, uh, you, if you say percentage of uh, uh, protein, then, you know, it's like, uh, it, it depends on your anthropometric measures. So I would like to say that about 1.5 uh, grams of protein per kg of your body weight. First, okay. you calculate the protein. And protein. then, you know, uh, then depending on your activity level, if you're, if you're not doing anything, at mm -hmm. all, you know, then okay. you, your carbohydrate should be lower. I mean, it shouldn't be very high, especially, and then even a high glycemic index, if you're doing, so you don't, you, you know, everybody, every individual is so different. I, I, different. I would not like to uh, generalize this at all. Uh, but you first, you know, the uh, very important macronutrient is protein. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, if you want a general guideline for the total calorie and you don't want to get into very complicated, uh, uh, reaction, you know, uh, equations, then 39 to 44 calories okay. per kilogram uh, of body weight for women and 44 to 50 calories uh, per kilogram of body weight for men. Okay. So this is one thing. Now that's the total calorie. Then you see the protein. Uh, protein, you can say 1.5. This is a general. This is only a general. 1.5 uh, gram per kg of your body weight. So you have okay. calculated the total calorie and the protein. Now, whatever is remaining, for women, I say you should take 30% uh, percent of your calories must come from fat, okay. at least. So, and then uh, the remaining you can give to uh, the carbohydrate. Now, see, if I, I'll give you an example of uh, Michael Phelps. I'm, I'm sure you all have heard of that. Uh, yes, he was yes. taking about 12,000 calories a day. You know, oh. so, um, you know, every day, in fact, uh, it might differ. So, you know, on days in which you have not done uh, training, you might like to uh, lower your entire total calorie intake also. If you, if you know, of certain days you're doing very heavy workout, uh, people do the opposite. On Saturday and Sunday, it's a weekend, I'm not training. So let me indulge and 
eat uh, everything that I should do, you know, so that happens on the ground. Uh, that, so you need to think of it like that. It's not very difficult, you know, you, uh, you can tell your clients to do it that way and then take guidance from you and monitor and see your result. It is really an ongoing process. So that's how it depends on the anthropometric measures. And uh, uh, I'm also uh, share with you some medical condition of mine. So mm -hmm. can I mailing you or something? You can mail to me, no problem. You know because I I I I, I take long. I write long answers. You know that's a, a little problem with me. Time and uh, words I always exceed. Uh, there's a question here: How to break plateau? Can we change fiber types in the body? Uh, you know, you have, I'm sure you're talking about slow twitch muscle fibers and uh, fast twitch muscle fiber. Uh, that definitely is uh, your genetic disposition and uh, even gender. Women have more of slow twitch muscle fiber and men have more of fast twitch muscle fiber. But you can, in, you can give hypertrophy. You know, uh, definitely, you know, if you are going to do more of volume training, then you will get uh, uh, hypertrophy in the slow twitch muscle fiber. The thickness of the muscle will increase. So you see uh, women, they don't get sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. Their size will not grow, but the shape of the muscle will come. So, you know, you will see a shape of the shoulder, bicep, lean shape. And that is because the muscle becomes thicker. So uh, women in the villages, they carry huge loads, they carry their children, they work in the farm, but they don't become something like Ronnie Coleman or Arnold Schwarzenegger. And that is because their uh, bodies are very firm, strong, thick, uh, iron bodies. Uh, you see the construction uh, building women, they are so strong, but they are lean. So uh, it, the, the muscle fibers, you know, they are, uh, uh, the, the, sarco, the fast twitch ones, they grow in size. So, you know, your ratio, you cannot change. But if you are work doing volume training and you're not doing heavy training at all and you're not taking the right nutrition, then your size will decrease, but the quality of muscle will increase. Like in these days, people are not going to the gym. They're staying at home. So when, you know, they're doing, uh, so they are, you need a progressive progression, you know, so you need progressive overloading. The best way to give progression in these days is by increasing the volume, number of repetition, decreasing the rest uh, period between sets, decreasing the frequency of your consecutive workout, doing success, you know, increasing the time under tension, doing uh, long negative repetitions. You can do so many things to uh, improve, you know, give progression. So when you are uh, giving increment in that manner, your slow twitch muscle fibers will increase. The advantage of doing both is if you are a power lifter and you're only doing your fast twitch muscle fiber, the one rep max one, the, there will be so much potential in you which is unexplored. But if you, in these days, if you strengthen all the other weak points, your joints, your uh, stretching, then after that, uh, you know, when you go to the gym and you start working on your heavy weights, uh, you know, you have a very strong foundation that will support your one rep max also. So uh, fiber types, uh, you should uh, train all. And if you have a specific athletic endeavor, then, you know, the principle of specificity uh, that has been mentioned in the International Sports Science Association granddaddy laws that says that you must, must uh, have that. If you're a football player, you cannot do cricket and, uh, you know, practice cricket and become a football player. You have to uh, practice uh, football if you want to be a football player. This goes without saying. There's such a universality about that law. So, uh, again, you know, coming back to your question that for fiber, the number of fibers you cannot change, but uh, you can work on them uh, to increase the ability of those specific muscles which are needed for your specific uh, athletic endeavors. And uh, how to break a plate you? A plate you is, you know, uh, you have to give progression. That is as simple as that. So if you are, uh, you know, if you are in your, uh, say, doing your one rep max and, you know, you are not able to go further beyond a specific load, then uh, just, just now I mentioned that, you know, you increase uh, your, your uh, uh, you know, progressive, you have to give a progressive overload. So push yourself and create variations in every way and strengthen the surrounding muscles and then come back to that and then the plateau will break. Sometimes the best way to break a plateau is to just continue doing the same thing. 
and then the plate you will be pushing yourself pushing yourself it may not uh, improve improve and then suddenly you get a breakthrough it happens a lot uh, for weight loss uh, clients, you know, when they, they, it just doesn't break, they give up. But if they don't give up and they just go on and on and on, definitely the plate you will break. Uh, yes, there's a question here. Do fat burners have any side effect? Yes, uh, definitely they have. If you're going to take, a, a, you know, thermogenic fat burner, you're going to overdose, you're going to have problem in your pulse rate. Uh, uh, okay, I don't want to talk about uh, steroids here. It goes without saying that even the slightest dose will have, uh, you know, I was just about to mention, but I don't want to do that here. And uh, then, you know, if you are going to do excess of anything, the fat burners I have told you are not going to harm you. But as far as dosage is concerned, you should be careful. Uh, as far as dosage is concerned, even if you eat too much of one food stuff, Say, suppose you go on an excessive uh, fat uh, diet or, you know, if you have too much of rice, too much of roti, too much of uh, non-vegetarian food and don't have fiber, uh, excess of anything is bad anyway. So uh, the fat burners I have mentioned to you are more or less good ones, but it's good to, good to cycle them for a primary reason that, uh, you know, the, your body adapts so quickly that, uh, you know, your body may, be, they may become ineffective after a while. So it's good to cycle them. It's good to teach your uh, body all the pathways so that you know, your body should be able to burn fat uh, without uh, fat burners and then with fat burners. So your body should learn, you're teaching your body. You, know? you, you treat your body as a beautiful entity and uh, have a relationship with that. Uh, hydroxycut, uh, Yes, the hydroxycut, which does not have ephedra, there are ones, and black mamba, some of them, they have ephedra. I really don't recommend that. Uh, immediately, you have effect on the ECG. Uh, so, but uh, black mamba and hydroxycut, there are ones without the, um, you know, without the ephedra, uh, which are good. The ones with the caffeine are extremely high, and you need to uh, understand how your relationship is with caffeine. Uh, after some time, caffeine becomes ineffective. And when you don't take caffeine, you know, that much, then you will feel very lethargic. There will be withdrawal symptoms. So it, that is the reason why you should cycle hydroxycut. You can take it if it is not having excess caffeine. A uh, little caffeine is good. Um, is there any specific diet to go with fat burners? Uh, it, that really depends on your body, you know, the diet with the fat burners, uh, you know, because you are... You may be, if you're taking fat burners, I assume, see, if you take any amount of fat burners, even a drum full of fat burners, fat burner, any fat burner, even if it's a steroid, let me say, it, it only helps to break fat. So the fatty acid, the fat, like say the triglycerol, that will break the three free fatty acids. Now the fatty acids are free. Now, unless and until you have created an exercise demand, it will not get ex uh, oxidized. It will re esterify and the free fatty acid will join again to form triglyceride. Okay, you can take the uh, horses to the water, but you cannot make it drink it. Now, if I uh, you know, cook food and I bring it and I put it on the table and I tell my son to eat it, if he doesn't eat it, what can I do? So it's the same as with fat burners. It will help you in every way. It will support, it will uh, you know, stimulate the adrenerg adrenergic receptors. The norepinephrine will become very effective. Anybody who is suppressing the norepinephrine has been suppressed. Uh, so we have done everything. We have got L-carnitine to oxidize it on the mitochondria. But if the energy demand is not there, then what will the fat burner do? The, the, it is free, now burn me. If you're not burning it, then it'll say, okay, I'm not burning, I will re-esterify and I will combine and form the fatty acid of fat again. So that's what happens. Uh, Ma'am, uh, I need to ask a doubt. Uh -huh. uh, regarding the pre-workout supplement and during the workout supplement, mm -hmm. what should be taken? Uh, pre-workout, um, I presume that you are doing a very uh, good workout. A lot of yeah. pre-workouts have... Uh, Mm, you know, caffeine in them. So caffeine is your prerogative. If you feel, you know, I used to carry in my competition days, I used to carry a pre-workout with caffeine with me all the time. Now I was working and sometimes I used to reach late and I would be so dead tired. So I used to use it selectively. Now the one with the caffeine, if I am very tired, I need to focus. I know that I'm not even able to initiate 
I would definitely go for a pre-workout. And uh, then there are pre-workouts with uh, without caffeine, but they have arginine and they have essential uh, amino acids like cysteine and uh, of course the branch chain amino acids. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you take the ones with them, you will be able to maintain a positive nitrogen balance. So if you are, uh, if you have, uh, you know, if you're very tired and you feel caffeine should be used very selectively. The black uh, coffee is a good sub, uh, thing for pre-workout, black coffee. Yes, yes. Black coffee is very good. Uh, uh, you know, black coffee has got a lot of antioxidants also. I like black coffee very much. But there is one thing that your body will get used to it. So you should cycle that also. The second thing is that if you're doing your workout in the daytime, it's perfectly fine. If you're doing it in the evening, you know, I have done that mistake. Let me tell you that it's my, my, my own self. What happens is that you will get very tired. You will sleep all fine. You know, you will get very tired. You will, uh, you know, you will, uh, after taking caffeine at night, say you do an eight or 9 PM, uh, you take on your coffee and then you do your workout, say till 10, 10, 30, 11, the gym closes, you come back, you take your post-workout shake and so on. And then you sleep. You will be able to sleep because you're tired. The problem is that the quality of sleep, you know, that there are so many sleep, you have, you need to complete three or four sleep cycles and each sleep cycle has uh, you know, a period of uh, REM and NREM, the, uh, you know, the rapid eye movement and the non-rapid eye movement. And that is when so many biochemicals are sickly. That's a very, very limited period where the inner lining of the stomach heals, your brain cells heal. You know, uh, it is so important. Otherwise, you will, one of that's a major reason uh, why you don't see result in so many other fields also. Even in your examination, you feel frustrated you're not able to perform uh, because so many uh, chemical reactions help on, happen only in that deep phase. So I even now, uh, I wear a watch, uh, not for the steps, you know, because as I do Bharatanatyam, I've stopped running, you know, because the Bharatanatyam is so intense. It, the, it has nothing to do with the number of, uh, uh, you know, steps. Uh, and But I still get a good cardiovascular workout. So it's not to do with the steps. The why I wear the fitness watch is just to monitor my quality of sleep. I see how much is the, uh, you know, the restful sleep that I have and how much is, uh, you know, the motionless one and one which is, you know, uh, in a mid, uh, mid level kind of sleep. And unless and until you're doing those three to four uh, deep sleep cycles, you're not going to benefit. What happens that when you take caffeine, uh, in the late evening and you still sleep, the quality of sleep will not let the hypertrophy happen. See, the, uh, one of the granddaddy laws is the supercompensation law. So if you are not allowing the supercompensation, if not giving enough rest and uh, nutrition, uh, you know, your, your purpose of uh, bringing about uh, micro trauma, you know that in the gym, you're not growing your muscle, you're breaking the muscle there. It is when you go home and when you rest and you provide nutrition, that is when your strength increases and your, the brain will tell the body that, uh, uh, you know, I need, uh, this muscle is being used too much. It is too much in demand. Let me grow bigger. So that, that is one of the examples of supercompensation is the calluses that you develop, the overgrowth in the skin. So if you are, uh, you know, if you are not giving the time for super compensation, then the entire purpose of the uh, supplements and workout is lost. So that's why ca taking caffeine in the evening hours may not be effective unless and until, you know, you are just not able to work out at all because you're tired because of practical reasons. And that's a compromise. And during, during the workout supplement? The best supplement I have, you know, taken is, uh, uh, you know, um, I'm not a brand ambassador, but extend. Uh, that is uh, uh, glutamine and uh, it's a combination of glutamine and branch chain amino acids. It's excellent. It will help in recovery. It will keep you a positive uh, nitrogen balance. Uh, ma'am, ma'am, one thing. How to check the authenticity of the supplement? Because there are hundreds of brands in the market. Everybody is promoting their own way. How to check that this is the genuine and authentic supplement? Because oh, there the is no government body or a medical body which gives the certificate. Yes, the FSASAI is there, uh, you know, the Food Safety and Security Association of India. You give a sample, they will test it for you. And anybody can go and do it there, actually. Uh, what happens is that these people who import supplement, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, they are doing it in the gray market and they have a section of uh, duplicate supplements and uh, 
Uh, there, it's a big scandal. You know that there is a lot of supplement in USA. Uh, what they do is when the when the due date is out, they uh, you know they they put the, they dump the supplements in uh, Jabal Ali. Other countries. Yeah. Yeah, Jabal Ali, where they, they have uh, very uh, cheap, uh, you know, go downs and there is no duty there. And then they uh, relabel and send it uh, with all the barcodes and all. And so that is very, very disheartening. It so, happens. But how to check it when we are buying it from the market? How to check it that it is a most authentic and genuine supplement? See, one thing is that you will get it with a bill. Don't buy without bills. You know, even okay. if it's uh, if you're ch being charged more, we pay taxes. Uh, the second thing is that uh, if you if you still have a doubt that there's something wrong, then you can just get it tested in the laboratory. There's really no other way, really. And the third thing is, of course, to go to the website, write an email to them, send them the barcode and uh, tell them to authenticate it. Okay. See, uh, once you know that, you know, this source is reliable, see, the person who does wrong will always do wrong. Once you know that this source is really reliable, then... Uh, you know, it will work for you. But there is no government body or which certifies that this is tested all the parameters and all in India. The FSCI does it. It does it. But uh, but it know, doesn't give certificate to any of the supplement I have seen. See, the lab test, you know, if you go to an actual lab, uh, they charge you a lot of money and they take a lot of time. They put it in uh, waiting. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I have actually... Uh, taken up, uh, you know, I, I don't want to name anybody, but I've taken up uh, supplements and given them. I, I've not done that in India. It's very difficult. But you uh, will see results in you. You will see results in you. Okay, but you never know whether that side effects also come and all it comes no. in due course see, of time. Uh, the, the problem is that if you're getting it with bill and, you know, you still have a doubt, the maximum side effect that can happen is that it will not be effective as, as you wish. But it will not cause you uh, you know, uh, that kind of side effects which you are imagining. See, whey protein, you know, once the uh, expiry date has gone, uh, it may have a little bit of sugar in it. Uh, it may become ineffective. The protein chains may have a natural breakdown with time, but they will still remain aminos. Uh, unless and until it's got some, uh, you know, uh, because they are sealed, vacuum sealed, they will not have fungal or, you know, that kind of thing in them. So it will not have that kind of side effects, you know, which you're but damaging the kidney or liver or something like that. Uh, and, uh, if Intestine. it is protein, then yes. But, but if it is that fake, if it is that fake, it's not just not an expiry date issue. If it's really that fake, you will know it by experience for sure. Okay. And how soon it start giving the result within a month or how? Yes. How? yes. You will feel it, you know, you will feel it, you know, uh, it, this is uh, people who have, uh, don't have experience, find it difficult. If you're doing it with a coach and you will feel it from inside, you know, the visible result may not be there, but from outside, what happens is that you will feel that strength, you will feel uh, an agility, you will feel that, uh, you know, there is a, uh, I don't want to technically use that word, but you'll feel toned, you know, you'll feel better toned. I don't like to use the word tone. I like to use hypertrophy, you know, but because that is what is happening. Uh, so because, within 30 days? Yes, one month you should see result. You should feel the result, not see. But in one month you should feel that if you're not feeling result, then something is wrong in the efficacy of the product. Got it. Thank you. Uh, low level testosterone, imp uh, what's the impact on men and women? Uh, uh, testosterone is basically meant for strength and the, um, you know, hemocrit uh, readings. So uh, testosterone, if you don't have, you know, the muscle tone will go down drastically. Your strength will be very low. And also uh, the you will get anemic because the, the uh, blood counts will really go down. And of course, in men, uh, testosterone is directly related to erectile dysfunction also. Uh, why doctors not suggest chronic uh, supplement in chronic liver disease if that person has uh, see uh, these days a lot of doctors are recommending proteins let me tell you that uh, some doctors do say that um, i know a doctor who said that don't eat uh, four egg whites that's too much uh, doctors study nutrition only for a small module in their first year they are doing more of medication, biochemistry, and when people come to them in serious condition. 
unfortunately doctors are so commercialized that they only remember the brand names and they are seeing their patients day and night they forget the theory that is the difference between doctors and fitness professional professionals fitness professionals are taking care you know they are doing preventive medicine actually so uh, doctors who are fitness conscious who are very aware and alert they understand but i know doctors who are scared even of taking protein and they won't bat an uh, eyelid when they go and have a burger at mcdonald's which is so grossly wrong so um, uh, why uh, in chronic liver disease they may not suggest uh, protein one of the reasons can be when protein breaks down the a by product uh, that is uh, produced is ammonia so ammonia has a certain toxicity so they if you already have a problem in the liver then uh, you know they may they may like you to prevent excess uh, protein and just be on a carbohydrate diet uh, long time use of creatine damage the kidneys if you are not uh, using the creatine then it will be converted into creatinine and that will uh, affect that will overload your kidneys so you take kidney uh, creatine and uh, you know use it for a while and then you have to cycle it and you have to take a lot of water with creatine because creatine has a limited function it will improve your one rep max uh, duration you know if you're doing the you know, your it, it is effective in the atp atp cp phase very effective very good supplement but uh, it is you you must cycle it for sure uh ma'am oil massage external oil massage of the body which mm -hmm. oils you suggest uh it's actually ma mainly the movement but the the how you know your uh, the kind of massage is just a feel good factor uh, some people suggest aroma oil because they have certain properties and because it is uh, directly related to the nervous system uh, but uh, you know olive oil and uh, mustard oil you know movements uh, it depends on the movement if you, because your body, your the hand should move nicely and smoothly uh, uh, especially in the kind of movement so olive oil uh, mustard oil uh, and a mix of oil is is very good for uh, massage massage is a very good thing you know it uh, it helps externally in stimulating and uh, uh, touch is a very important thing for human beings a lot of people live alone these days uh, you know it has its therapeutic uh, aspects and it's very healing uh, so it it also helps you if you have too much of uh, lactic lactic acid uh, accumulation the touch is healing in the sense that uh, you know once it uh, once you touch and you're stimulating that part of the skin uh, you know the healing process there is more blood circulation in that area and that also helps uh, ma'am ayurvedic products like ashwagandha shilajit and safed musli can you put yes. some knowledge on yes uh, uh, so they are meant for uh, high levels of testosterone and they have um, the powers in healing uh, you know ayurveda depends on the vat kapha and pitta uh, phenomena no. and so uh, they have balancing properties and overall conditioning in the body they are very good ashwagandha uh, shilajit you know they say that if you have taken shilajit even once in your life uh, it has got life saving properties forever so you know if you if you undergone uh, you know certain traumas and all and you've taken you've taking you're taking shilajit it's it's going to help you a lot uh, it is very good for the testosterone levels it is very good for cognitive performance uh, but ayurveda you know anything to do with ayurveda uh, you know it is it is worked for by ancient wisdom and uh, these are the properties that are claimed by it uh, they are not done you know uh, just the way you have the allopathic uh, you know supplements work so it can be sub substitute for uh, supplements uh, yes like testosterone booster you know they have the, okay so the herbal testosterone boosters have ashwagandha and shilajit anyways uh, people do that i know people who have done that no uh, for whey protein and creatine and glutamine whatever we are discussing so instead of that we can substitute with safed musli ashwagandha or shilajit etc no that is uh, you know okay. they are herbs you know whey protein is uh, is a pure protein it has got a chain structure of carbon hydrogen and oxygen and nitrogen and the nitrogen it is food ashwagandha shilajit they are herbs they are not the whey protein is food 
So uh, if your body is using a lot of glutamine and uh, that is being utilized, it is present in the body as glutamine and you are supplementing it with glutamine. It is very simple. It's two plus two, four. Ashwagandha, you know, these herbs act as catalysts. Catalyst is, is something which expedites uh, certain energy, uh, so chemical reactions in the body and they help biochemical reactions to take place. But for that, the basic substrate and raw material should be there. In case of non-veg uh, for bodybuilding and heavy workouts, mutton is suggested more than anything else like fish or chicken, mutton. And that too, yeah, the boiled one, no legs, uh, feet and all. See, the mutton, the, uh, these mutton, beef and all these, uh, uh, you know, these non-vegetarian foods, they have a lot of uh, creatine and glutamine uh, naturally. And uh, so you see the uh, people in UK, they're so strong, you know. They walk and their calves and they don't, some of them don't do anything and they are still, still so strong. But the thing is that they have a lot of saturated fat. So you can use the lean part. There is, you know, there in, in the Western countries, they have the lean part and it's generally 99% lean if they, if they have it, they've packaged it like that. Uh, but, uh, lean you know, they're only uh, breast and all, no leg piece. Lean yes, part means. Yes. Yes. And uh, so what happens is that, uh, uh, so the saturated fats, of course, that has to be avoided. But, you know, their uh, biological value, the nitrogen retention of higher proteins is uh, not as much as that of uh, chicken and fish. So their, uh, their nitrogen re retention of the lower proteins is uh, higher. So it is good to take a combination. So, uh, you know, I would like suggest like in the breakfast, if you're taking egg white, and in your uh, uh, second meal, you're taking, you know, afternoon meals, it's very good to take your red meats. If you're taking lean mutton, lean beef, and then, uh, you know, your third meal, this I'm saying for a bodybuilder, you know, everybody might not like to take four non-vegetarian meals. The third meal can be chicken and the last meal can have fish. So the more variety you give, you know, the more you're getting all the chains of amino acids and your requirement for supplementation will be drastically reduced. Okay, there is one question uh, that uh, this lady gets uh, uh, lower back pain during menses and what mineral and vitamins, uh, you're not getting my voice. Okay, but I hope that you can hear me. Uh, there, okay, one more question. International Sports Academy, creatine and caffeine supplements have been banned in many countries. Okay, I'll tell you uh, both now. Uh, the, uh, the, the lower back pain during periods, you know, that a, uh, a lot of hydration is good for the lower back. Uh, Omega-3 is very good because it helps in the joints. Vitamin C is very good. Vitamin C helps in uh, formation of collagen. And uh, so that these are very good supplements and goes without saying that the lower back muscles need to be strengthened by uh, yoga and the hyperextensions and also supplementation of proteins because proteins are important for uh, bone uh, building also and muscle building and the tendons, ligaments. The bone in the sense, I told you the IGF-1 level goes up and the alkaline phosphate level goes up and uh, serum alkaline phosphate is important for bone formation. Now that helps with proteins. So uh, proteins are also important for bone building. Now that comes with a pro prolonged use of protein. Now, uh, the, for the uh, lower back, you know, you should go to a, you know, a physiotherapist or uh, practice yoga and all the therapeutic modalities. And uh, also you can go to a chiropractor. Chiropractor will really help in this case. Um, then the uh, creatine and caffeine. Yes, they are banned. Uh, but, you know, coffee is not a banned substance. It's not a drug. It's just caffeine. So if you are doing any sport for which you need to give a blood test to the VADA or NADA, then you must stop this before, uh, much before, a few weeks before your uh, actual competition. So, uh, because if you're doing bodybuilding, then no, you're not tested for caffeine. You're not tested for uh, uh, creatine. Uh, and creatine, as I told you, needs to be cycled. Even if you're doing a bodybuilding competition, you know, creatine has to be cycled. And uh, if you're taking creatine monohydrate uh, before, just before the competition, you don't want to take uh, uh, 
uh, too much of creatine, obviously. So it is to build your long-term strength, to support you. And then in the, la in the last days, it is the CNS uh, strength that you're using because you've been doing it so many times with supplements that you develop the strength naturally anyways, and then you can just let go. So I think... Uh, uh, Hello? Yes, yes. Uh, Ma'am, Sunny here from Pune. Uh -huh. Ma'am, first of all, I would like to thank you. Uh, basically, uh, this webinar was the best value for money. <laughs> you have okay. been so descriptive and so knowledgeable. Yes, you're very welcome. Thank you. I will always be there. I will always be there. Yeah, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, I wanted to clarify two things. So, uh, first thing was, uh, as you mentioned, that brain can only use glucose. So I have read in some uh, papers or some people who, you know, share like ketogenic diets, they say okay. ketones can also cross the blood brain barrier as ketone and uh, glucose both are six carbon atoms. So can you throw some light on that? Yes, uh, that is there, you know, but, uh, but the process is giving so many byproducts, you know, the uh, ketoacidosis and the uh, removal of that, you know, that the byproducts of uh, when the ketones are used for energy, definitely, you know, uh, I'm not denying that uh, because okay. people are surviving on a ketogenic diet. The second thing is it is not very uh, practical. And the third thing is that uh, once you get back to carbohydrates, what happens is that your body has almost forgot, forgotten how to metabolize carbohydrate. Now, suppose you are on a ketogenic diet and you're going on a flight and you, it's a long flight and the, the uh, airlines is giving you, uh, say, a sandwich to eat. What do you do? Then okay. uh, secondly, you know, you need to uh, you need insulin to, for your nutrients to get inside the cell. And for that, you need an insulin spike. And the moment you take a high glycemic index carbohydrate, you're out of ketosis. So it's not going to work. That's my point. And secondly, that the byproducts of that is... Uh, uh, you know, it's so so harmful that we just don't want to do it. You know, unnecessarily. I got I got your point about the ketogenic diet. I, it was just about the ketone and glucose. Okay. Thank you very much for that. And ma'am, uh, the second thing is, uh, as you mentioned about antioxidants. So, uh, is it that only who one who does exercises or is involved in some sports only he needs antioxidants because oxygen is going to be radicalized for everybody. You know. Yes. The, yes. The need increases if you're doing workouts, but you're very right. Like, yep. you know, if there is so much of pollution these days. Secondly, so many food products are uh, GMO, the genetically modified foods. And we have so much of pollution in everything that we're taking that there is no end to the free radical damage that can be caused by infinite number of things, whether it's air, water, food, whatever we are taking. Uh, you know, people think that we don't want uh, non-vegetarian food because of this or this side effect, but you don't know that even the plants have fertilizers, which are, uh, you know, very, very obnoxious chemicals. And so, uh, you know, you need antioxidants, just that if you are exercising, then the need increases uh, substantially. And ma'am, uh, can you throw some light on the intramuscular triglycerides? Yes, intramuscular triglyceride. Oh, that's a that's a very uh, wonderful thing. Uh, intramuscular triglyceride is the fat that is present. Used in the, for energy. Uh, yes, it is uh, in the slow twitch muscle fiber, and uh, you know, in women especially, uh, it is the IMTG that is used a lot uh, for energy, more than the glycogen also, and uh, so you know, if for uh, if you. If you want the IMTG to be used, then you should be doing a volume work also. So that is the fat it's that is so time, time under tension theory. Absolutely, yes, yes. That's a that's a very brilliant thing you can do. You know, we have a lot of it in the in Bharatnatyam. A lot of people ask me that being a bodybuilder, how do you do Bharatnatyam? There is no uh, matching of that, but I feel that uh, you know they are a part of each other because we have extreme isometric holds. The uh, gym trainers, uh, you know, an exercise routine, say about uh, 30 seconds to 40 seconds and 
we are given punishments with that for you know four minutes of isometric holds and there are performances sometimes for 20 minutes so isometric holds are uh, you know i know what it means to do that i mean i see girls crying at the natale so i'm just giving you an experience and a perspective that so uh, ma'am ma in your uh, training experience have you trained with dennis james uh, the okay. mqt thing yeah yeah, yeah. okay he used to be very surprised that uh, when i was one day he told me to do leg extensions very slowly and then uh, do a circuit training with the uh, walking lunges and then when i did that and i thought that after the walking lunges i have to go and do the leg extension again and so he said oh my god hold it and then there was that uh, you know uh, ali from uh, the uh, us army who was training at that time with him and uh, he kept calling me the next day and saying are you not sore how is it possible so i said that's because i do a lot of bharatnatyam and so i know that i can keep the time under tension very well and they, that was a very uh, wonderful he had recorded that and put it on his uh, uh, on his page in those years and that was long back i think this incident was thank you and ma'am uh, just another question uh, it's not uh, more of a question it's more of a perspective what do you think about a steroid free free use of bodybuilding like steroid free bodybuilding <laughs> can it be done like many <laughs> old champions are coming these days and they're saying they're steroid free and what happens is uh, there are long lot of young boys who are very much attracted in the age of 18 to 23 they are immediately attracted towards steroid use for stage competitions can you yeah. throw some light on this like uh, yes, yeah. that of course, without saying that steroids uh, you know they they really destroy you uh, when you compete at a pro level you know uh, unfortunately you know everybody is on a super bike you know you're going uh, i can work very hard and walk very fast and run very fast but if uh, somebody much weaker than me is riding on a super bike he is he or she is going to go ahead of me as simple as that so you get the point you know that when you're doing on a, going on a stage when there are 70 or 80 competitors on stage uh, with the steroids and then you are the only one who is natural if you're talking about mike ohern or some of the people who claim uh, to be Mm, I mean, there are some people in India too who think that they're very intelligent, but it goes without saying that uh, you know that's not so. When you're competing, you are somehow forced to take it. Uh, that is one of the reasons I stopped competing uh, because I knew that beyond uh, going to pro level, you know, it's very you can get you know in the long term. See, uh, initially there were bodybuilders who were spending uh, five, six, ten years without competition. They were first building a base. They were learning exercise. They were studying, and then they were exploring. They used to go and uh, be with people, develop their diet, develop their control, uh, work on their mindset, their psychology, and then uh, you know talk about the federation, know the federation rule, and then think of competing. Now, uh, you know, just to be in the limelight, people just uh, take uh, want to want a body in six months. So. Yeah. Uh, in the age of 18 to 22, as you said, they already have high levels of testosterone, uh, you know, which is being produced endogenous. And if they, if you are going to, you know, if you're going to uh, give at that time, you know, it's really going to destroy the body. So just imagine that, uh, you know, they have their whole lives ahead of them. I'll, I'll tell you, uh, since you have just raised this topic, I'll give you a very, very tiny example of uh, girls who take clenbuterol. That's essentially a bronchodilator. I saw one girl who developed fibrosis in her lungs. That will never go. Now, just imagine at this time you develop, uh, you have fibrosis in your lungs. And uh, what the COVID-19 is doing is to increase the level of fibrosis in the lungs. It will yeah. never go. It will harden the lungs and, you know, you, she will not be able to breathe. Now you've got to live your life. You know, God, once your life is gone, you are over. You know, you are, you're not even going to exist. What would you do those few days of limelight for? Uh, so, uh, you know, your entire life is ruined if you take it at that young age. So I think you should really refrain from it. And it, uh, 
you have to begin at your individual level to uh, promote that you know uh, bodybuilding you know itself is a very very positive sport any person who is measuring his or her diet is living for long term strength and fitness and is uh, working on uh, improving his strength is building something positive so building your body is bodybuilding but when you go into competitive bodybuilding it becomes a completely different uh, you know uh, perspective so when you develop when you if you want to go into competition then you really need to uh, rethink for girls fortunately there are divisions like the bikini figure fitness uh, now wellness has come in um, except for the physique divisions most of them are very feminine now and very soft divisions so they can manage but for men uh, you know although it is uh, they are testosterone dominant individuals uh, you know the competitive bodybuilding is uh, you know something which they really need to think about when they make their decisions to compete thank you ma'am thank you thank you uh, ma'am uh, the food products for ligaments and joints uh, see there's uh, food products food products is um, you know the supplement is uh, the best supplement is of course glucosamine chondroitin sulfate chondroitin is the chondrocytes this is the cartilage uh, cells and you can uh, make a stack with uh, vitamin c because it helps to develop collagen you can have fish oil uh, which has omega 3 and so you have a stack to uh, you know improve your joint strength but otherwise uh, you know you can take uh, them you know the crustacean the uh, you know foods in the crustaceans then you can have uh, you know the omega 3 and uh, you know in natural fish salmon tuna they all have omega 3 uh, vitamin c is present uh, you know we don't have that thing in corona days everybody knows where vitamin c is uh, there is a rope ro rose hip extract which has like lime i told you the entire vitamin c gets oxidized but rose hip extract is something uh, which is uh, which gives you a slow release of vitamin c and it will not get oxidized so uh, if you look even you know if you don't get rose hip of course then if you look for supplement instead of getting the vitamin c from amla supplements try rose hip extract that's a very good uh, uh, thing so to get your joints as well as for the ligaments yes see and yes of course these are the foods but you know uh, you you need for the ligaments is ligaments is basically kind of elastic kind of things Yeah. and uh, so the protein and vitamin c you know they form collagen but the thing is you must remember that uh, understand until you are stretching uh, you know there's a golgi there's a something called proprioceptory neuromuscular facilitation and unless you know when you contract your muscles they are like that and then they need to be lengthened back so uh, ligaments need to be lengthened so anything like yoga and you need to actually stretch it and flexibility increases by the day so if you're taking supplements is it's an excellent thing that you can do but you must also uh, do the activity to support the uh, what about these things paya soup karode oh yes they have collagen yes paya soup karode is excellent especially for the joints but you know everybody may not like it and that that's something which uh, even non vegetarian people uh, they don't like it another problem with it is that they are very high in saturated fats so if the if you if you're taking care of the rest of your calories that's that's a very good thing you can do yeah i forgot that thank you for reminding me uh, there's a question here adenosine monophosphate helps to make atp fast uh, while see adenosine monophosphate is amp and uh, Uh, oh my goodness uh, atp cycle yes uh, it does but you know why do you want to take amp uh, i heard so many things so many stories about amp recently and i would uh, suggest that don't take that amp it's a uh, uh, you know you can do i mean amp is uh, newly i think i've heard of it since about 3 uh, years but uh, you know you can do without it and uh, the you know all time uh, legendary bodybuilders never had amp believe you me they never had amp uh, you know uh, learn to develop uh, the strength from your cns from your will power and over a period of time and gain positive hypertrophy uh, amp does help no doubt about that but it will just help you amp will help you to get the strength for that few minutes that's it it will not increase the size of the muscle it will not increase your strength it will not increase your uh, thickness of the muscle 
in any way whatsoever. It will not increase your long-term strength. Like if you take creatine or you take NO, you know, arginine, it will increase your strength. And when you stop also, that strength will stay because it has, you have enhanced your CNS also and you've got hypertrophy. It, these supplements will help you. AMP will give you strength at that time. And the, then it will not give you the long-term gains. No matter what, even if you're doing a stronger rep. You, you take AMP, you will do a strong rep. You stop taking AMP, you will do a weak rep. That's it. Because if you keep taking a supplement, then you know you start, you learn to lift heavy. And then without a supplement also, then you can continue to lift heavy. But AMP doesn't give you that benefit. It is AMP is only to show off in the gym. Believe me. Only in that, uh, that one day if you want. Whenever I trained in the gym, I must tell you this. Whenever I trained in the gym, I used to tell myself. I am not training to impress these four or five people. My target is a big international stage. My target is there where hundreds of people are going to watch me. They are going to judge me. Well, when international judges are going to judge me and mark me, my target is big. My target is not those five people uh, in the gym. Uh, Ma'am, not a good supplement. This Munakka Pani, is it uh, good as a uh, during workout? I mean, Actually, uh, that is, uh, you know, more of a anti, uh, antioxidant uh, function, the manakka. It's not going to manakka be... Pani. Ha, water dipped in with manakka, that water can be used uh, during a workout, as a workout it's meal? A good thing. It will have the minerals, you know, but uh, and the antioxidants, but it's a good thing. But it's not going to help you to uh, kind of uh, replenish your... Uh, Aminos or keep you in positive nitrogen. Not but in that. It's a during workout signal, and after workout, we can have the whey protein for all these things which you are mentioning. Yes, whey protein you can have after workout. But uh, you know, if you eat manaka, it may raise the glycemic index and it will help you to erase the insulin. But the manaka water will not give you an ins uh, give uh, help to increase your uh, glycemic index. But nevertheless, it's not a bad thing. It's a very good thing. It will replenish the chemicals, uh, the minerals. It's and a good during thing. workout, I am asking for only during workout as of drinking water. Yes, yeah. you can do that. Because during workout, you need to hydrate yourself anyways. So why not do it with electrolytes and, uh, and your yeah. uh, minerals? Yes, that's a good And ask for whey protein and amino protein, we can, amino acid and all, we can take the post-workout supplement. Post-workout, yes, you can do that. Fine. There are many ways of approaching it. So this is also a very good way. No doubt about that. And for pre-workout, we can have a a raw potato or banana or boiled potato or banana just 30 minutes before the workout or one hour before yes. the workout? 30 minutes, 30 minutes is minutes? fine. 30, 30 minutes, minutes before fine. the workout? Yes, yes, that's fine. Banana or a boiled potato? Yes, yes, it's very good. Uh, slow release carbohydrate, so 30 minutes is fine. Okay, even if it is a high intense workout? Yes. Uh, you know, Chris Asito, uh, Chris Asito is a very famous trainer. He trained Jay Cutler and now right now he's train, uh, training uh, Sean Roden. Uh, you know, he's, uh, he gives a, a, what you call a muffin before workout. And he's, he's very well known for that. Nobody does that. People say that it will raise the insulin and then bring down the blood sugar. But he says that the immediate spike in the blood sugar and then, see, insulin is never produced during workout. So if you just take it and start immediately, then that blood sugar that has risen will be used in the exercise. So that's another way of, I don't do that. We don't do that. But uh, I'm just giving you that there, there are hundreds of ways to approach a thing. And for him, you know, um, uh, who will doubt a legend like uh, Chris Asito, you know, uh, you know, he's uh, one of the legendary coaches. So, he's even called the real a, so even if it is a high intense workout, 30 minutes before that, eating like uh, this potato or a banana will suffice the purpose. Yes, but I'm not uh, telling you, I, you asked me one hour. The reason is that by, in one hour, you, will, you may start feeling, see, there is a, always when you start workout, no matter how experienced you are, no matter how experienced you are, I'm saying that again, there will be a little bit of anxiety with your performance. If you're a very uh, passionate and dedicated uh, you know, athlete, you know, you want to do your best. You're all excited. You want to perform. You want to gain. So before your workout, you'll have a little bit of anxiety that, oh, I might get tired and, and so on. So when you uh, have a sweet potato and banana, 
one hour before uh, you it is already a lot of time has passed and you know it might have just got absorbed as glycogen but if you're taking half an hour before it's kind of an in between time you know it will help you it is good thing uh, ma'am can you suggest any youtube channel which have regular update on this nutrients and supplements and it is authentic <laughs> i don't know follow my my workshops <laughs> <laughs> i don't know youtube but you know i i am actually now i was uh, i have been involved in many activities and uh, a lot of social work also and uh, you know i have a child i need to look after him uh, he has autism but i am now planning to uh, you know make my own youtube videos and uh, posts so that you know i can really give back uh, what all i have learned in fact i am really uh, thankful to bfy i never had the courage to even think of uh, Uh, you know giving sessions like that and uh, i got a very good uh, you know support and uh, you know encouragement from bfi to uh, initiate this and i am sure that uh, with experience and uh, taking more uh, workshops i will be able to give a lot lot more ma'am while uh, ma'am while using fat burners the exercise demand should be strength training or uh, yeah. is it is even okay with cardio training uh that's a very very good question yeah uh, see uh, the uh, fat is uh, burnt in women you see it is the imtg you know so i was asked about that and uh, the fat, free fatty or acid uh, free fatty acids are oxidized in the mitochondria of the active tissue so uh, you know the i it will be if you're doing weight training it will be utilized uh, you know as imtg in the muscle and if you're doing uh, cardiovascular exercise then it will be burnt where it is you know so it will be, it is useful in both you just need to create an exercise demand so uh, really because especially uh, you know in men a lot of glycogen is used what you should take care of and if you want your fat burner to be utilized is that your exercise should not be uh, very explosive or too intense because in that case it is muscle glycogen that is burned if you want fat to be oxidized then whether you're doing cardiovascular exercise or you're you know doing weight training it will uh, burn in both because it's a generalized see fat uh, will not be that spot reduction and uh, you know that fat burning with cream or belt and that's all bullshit you all know that so uh, it will burn this uh, fat burners will help you to burn fat in both ways the energy demand should be created and it should not be that uh, one rep max and uh, you know very explosive moves or hiit it will get fat will burn in steady state cardio and in uh, in weight training exercises both uh, ma'am what is good for the fitness calisthenics or weight training or a mix of both the best is mix people say weight training you know technically scientifically for hundreds of reason but you know i know that people who do weight training are not as when i go and see dancers or oh, they are super you know they are amazing so calisthenic is so beautiful and then what happens is when you do a combination of both then when you are say even you stepping out of your house there will be bounce in your walk you will be full of energy you know all the time your body can move anyway even when you're lying down you know that you are very much at ease all your joints everything is very flexible so there's a, a tremendous sense of well being it you cannot describe it so it should be a combination of both that is my personal experience it's that's in the books it's uh, generally weight training and i love weight training no doubt about that i've been I'm, i'm from a bodybuilding background i cannot say that i i love weight training but uh, you know if you want to really talk about fitness then a combination of both is is really good so i think uh, we can end this session here uh, and uh, you can all write to me you're very welcome uh thank you for joining me today and uh, it was a pleasure having you all i'm i'm very obliged that you trusted me with your time and your money and i hope that i will see you soon uh ma'am your email id is rita singh 76 @gmail.com at @hotmail.com oh sorry sorry and what's your mobile number uh it is uh, 98 let me write it in the chat 98112 uh oh my god wait 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 Nine eight one one two zero zero three zero two.
actually your mail id is still not visible in the chat to me at least okay i will write it again vita s i n g h 76 at the okay got it ma'am thank you right now i have given both now thank you thank you so much nikhil god bless you and uh, you. see you all uh, so uh, shall i do there's a little child there i love such things really uh, so uh, uh, rajiv ji i think uh, we can end this session anybody your from number is still not visible my number Slide is not double one two yes double zero three zero two Uh, this is a this is a privately or oh, it's saying privately uh said okay oh my god now i know everyone in the way <laughs> i'm so uh, 00302 no let me write that that's important and uh, i'll write my email again rita as i and number is there in the group i guess yes yes let's to the group yes it is there in the group okay now it must be visible right again the m is missing but i think you can get it from the group and i will i will uh, write my email id in the group also and uh, so see you all and thank you once again yeah thanks okay. a lot thank you ma'am bye bye and uh, rajiv ji are you here anybody from bfy uh, no ma'am i think no one's from bfy I thought that they are now talking about themselves. Just leave them alone. <laughs> This is very prolonged, but that's fine. That's fine. I loved it. Anyway, I will leave and uh, thank you all so much and bye bye. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Bye bye. I loved uh, watching your. Uh, I think it's your son. <laughs> I give my love to him. Yeah, sure. Ajit, tell a hi. Hi hello bye bye take care be fit be